Hello, and welcome to the Alexander Society. It's a podcast, and we talk about, you know, history stuff, like like uh, the absolute nerds that we are. And, and we, we drink to forget about how bad human history really is. I, I guess. I guess that's why we drink. I mean, I just drink because I, I like the... That's the excuse we tell ourselves. I just like the little buzzy feeling that it gives me in my head that I never seem to remember in the morning. You know, same, same. Oh, I forgot where I was going with this. Fuck. Sorry, I am tired. How have you been this week, Derek? Um, If you couldn't tell, I'm actually pretty tired and my brain is not all there right now. But, you know, we're, we're getting through it. No, I would have never guessed. Yeah, it's it's just... It's honestly my own fault. Like I haven't, there isn't anything that's been like pulling at me recently. It's just a matter of, uh, I just I haven't been getting enough sleep, man. I keep myself up too late. Same. I'm an insomniac. So Tim, what are you drinking this fine night? So I unfortunately did not finish my, uh, Cimarron tequila last week. So that's what I'm working on this week on liquor. Still, I'm going to finish that bottle if I'm, damned if i do damned if i don't then um there's this local brewing uh company near my old hometown called iron monk and they have a new beer called 1890 it's supposed to be osu themed i didn't care that it was osu themed i mean like i still like osu since it's close to my hometown but it's a brewery i like you know yeah i was i was in the liquor store today and i was really tempted to get some of the iron monk stuff that i saw but I found something that looked better. I, I love Iron Monk. Yeah. So what I'm drinking today. What are you drinking, Derek? I was just getting to that. If you'd let me talk. <laughs> <laughs> Asshole. Do go ahead, sir. Tonight, uh, for my sipper, I'm doing Mountain Fork, uh, the Rooster, which is like a Mexican ale. Uh, they're another. They're a local place too. They're brewed in. Uh, how do you pronounce this? Hocha Town, oh, Hocha Town, Oklahoma, I guess. Oh, my stupid. Spell it. H O C H A T O W N. Hocha Town. And so for my shots, uh, I got some Pendleton whiskey. It's nothing special. It's just some Western style style whiskey. Fair. It's fair. I haven't had a chance to try it yet. My desk did though. <laughs> your desk is getting a lot to drink recently hasn't it yeah my desk is two two recording sessions in a row and i'm just giving like whole shots of liquor and whole cans of beer to my desk asshole's gonna drink me dry god stupid desk anyways so in this society this illustrious organization of ours we have a set of rules that we abide by rule number one is we take a shot at the start of every episode. Prost. Cheers. Hmm. Yep, that's whiskey. Ooh. Oh, that, it's really good, but man, it's whiskey. Ooh. Oh, what's the second rule, Tim? Our second rule is if there's an event where someone dies, we take a sip. Rule number three is if we mention somebody who is in a previous story, a previous topic, we take a sip. Rule number four, if alcohol is mentioned, we will take a sip. Rule number five, if there's an event in the story where someone dies and alcohol is involved, we take a shot, which that does happen a couple times in this episode is a little, uh, a little teaser. As always, you're still trying to get me drunk, aren't you? Yeah, I think this is going to be one of those episodes. I didn't think it was when I first I was first writing it out, but uh, who boy that ending. Uh, we also have we also do we also do have special rules for each topic for each series that we do. The special rules for our our current topic, Mister Ethan Allen, will be first one. Every time someone religious does something weird because of their religion, we take a shot. The other rule is with someone names their kids something really stupid we take a shot yeah yeah and who boy were there a lot of really bad names in colonial america it's actually impressive how many bad names they they got really creative the colonials did with coming up with just the worst names imaginable you're not kidding those names some of those names are ridiculous like I feel like they had to be like, oh, this one's not going to survive, so we'll just give them a goofy shit name. Yeah, because it was all like either like poorly translated biblical names or like old like cla like stuff they learned from in classics class. 
if we ever do um if we ever do an episode on the civil war or any part of the civil war i'm bringing this rule back because we'd have a lot of good <laughs> good ones <laughs> a lot of good opportunities for that did it happen a lot during the civil war too oh yeah there are some wild names um i mean like we were talking about general sherman last episode uh his middle name was tecumseh which it's, it isn't weird if you're from like if you're native but he was white as hell his parents were white as hell was he part native oh i, I was literally just asking did he have any native yeah no he was no nah, his whole family was white as hell more cultural appreciation by the colonizers cultural appreciation you're already slurring your words <laughs> it was more like a lisp but hey ho oh look at me making fun of a making fun of a uh, speech impediment God, I'm an asshole. So I don't have one, but it was more in that sense slurring. Ring. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. Tim, do you remember where we left off? It was getting really close to the start of the Civil War, wasn't it? Like that first, get, like almost the year. The Revolutionary War. Uh, yes, uh, that's what I meant to say. Did I say Civil? Yeah, you said Civil War. <laughs> well, you're the one who brought it up earlier. But um, I meant to say Revolutionary War. Um. They were the you the shot heard around the world had happened. I know that, but I, I don't think it had really gotten into full swing yet. It had basically, if I'm remembering correctly, yeah. So like the war part of the war hadn't quite happened, but the first battles had happened at Lexington and Concord. And well, here let's just jump right into it. When we left off, Ethan Allen, Benedict Arnold, and a collection of Green Mountain Boys and New England militia had just pulled off the first offensive military action in Ameri- of the American forces in the Revolutionary War, and by extension in the history of the American military when they captured Fort Ticonderoga. So that's where we're at. Many firsts. Many, many firsts, yes. Naturally, this being a collection of armed men pumping with adrenaline and revolutionary fervor, the first thing they did to celebrate their monumental victory was to break into the fort commander's private stock in the cellar and drink 90 gallons of rum. I'll drink to that. Yeah, it's a sip. That's why I said I'll drink to that. <laughs> Very quickly, nearly all of the Green Mountain boys were slobbering drunk. As soon as the fort was secured... You gotta celebrate, my dude. Oh, yeah, you gotta... Se- that's a big deal. Ticonderoga was like the trophy, like the... It was the crown jewel of the colonial British military. And there's just a bunch of free rum sitting around. Like, what else are you going to do? Chug, 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 chug. <laughs> oh, man, I can't imagine doing that with rum. Oh, that would probably hurt. That would hurt so bad. No, when I was at, when I was at school, I used to chug uh, Everclear for fun. And now I'm over here, like, cringing at the idea of chugging, uh, chugging rum. That, man, COVID messed me up. Anyways. I I just, I could never do liquor. I, I was never able to chug hardly anything, to be fair. Like, water's the only thing I can, like, drink fast. I've just never been able to drink other things fast. My normal sipping pace is pretty fast, though, for normal stuff. But, like, chugging, I've never been able to do. Yeah, I when I was a kid, I just, I, I was a weird kid. And I would just do random stuff that made me uncomfortable just to see how far I could push myself. And so I'd chug anything. Uh, I, that doesn't sound like a touch of the tism at all. <laughs> yeah. Like I touched, I, I chugged like half a, like half a bottle of like a liter of Mountain Dew once. Um, damn. Whenever I'd get like a bottle of water, instead of just sipping it, I just chug it all at once. I, I don't know why I did it. I don't do it anymore. Cause you know, I don't go out of my way to make myself uncomfortable, but it was a thing. Anyways, kids are dumb. Kids are dumb. (laughs) As soon as the fort was secured, Ethan and Benedict started butting heads, of course. One thing you need to know about Arnold was whenever he was in the field and he was on duty, he was obsessively professional. His orders were to secure the cannons at Ticonderoga and bring them to Boston as fast as possible so that they could use them against the British occupying force and liberate the city. For him... The sight of soldiers under his command getting drunk and looting while they had a responsibility of getting these cannons out was completely unacceptable. So he was the stick in the mud who wouldn't celebrate? Yep, he was the stick in the mud. And he made his objections known very loudly. 
Spoil sport. Yeah. He was rushing all around the fort, trying to get these men, his get get all these men, his own and the Green Mountain boys, uh, try to get trying to get them to sober up and to stop looting and to start getting these cannons moved. Two Green Mountain boys responded to this by firing a musket at him. Like actually at him? At him. Like they were trying to hit him. They were both wasted beyond comprehension. So they tried to take out Benedict Arnold before he'd even turn coated. Yep. Yeah. Uh that that would have Wow, can you imagine how different our history would have been? Like I'm probably not a whole lot different, but like if they had succeeded. Yeah, that would have well, it would have been really different because Arnold went on to do a lot of really important stuff. Like uh like like he won like probably the most important battle of the entire Revolutionary War. Interesting. So like it, it would have turned out really, really differently if it which I'm gonna talk about a little bit later on. But yeah, Benedict Arnold is a really important guy. And uh the fact that he's only known for the fact that he betrayed the Continental Army and not for the fact that he was one of their most invaluable commanders is I understand why, but it's still propaganda to its finest yeah but it's like that old vestige of propaganda they don't even consciously do it anymore it's just been propaganda for so long that nobody bothers to check why we say it anymore but but yeah so these guys were drunk so if they missed of course and arnold lived to fight another day but this guy was naturally furious no shit and demanded that ethan discipline oh yeah yeah and he he Went up to Ethan. He want he demanded that he discipline his troops. Ethan, the uh, asshole that he was, he saw this as Arnold trying to renege on their joint command deal that they had going for this for the taking of the fort. And he stripped Arnold of his command, which he really didn't have the authority to do. He confined him to quarters, which he really didn't have the authority to do. And he placed an armed guard on the door. Turncoats in timeout. <laughs> So yeah, now Arnold's in jail. <laughs> Benedict Arnold is under house arrest. Ethan wrote up a report on the attack, wrote up wrote up a report of the attack on the fort in a letter that he sent off to Connecticut. Uh, he also sent a copy to the recently formed Second Continental Congress in Philadelphia and one to Albany in New York just to rub their noses in it, really. There was an actual reason. It was because it was because the the revolutionary government in Albany or in New York would be responsible for uh, getting the garrison at Ticonderoga, like guns and supplies and stuff because Ty- uh, Ticonderoga was in New York. And so there he was kind of just filling the man and saying, Hey, we're, we've got this fort now and we're going to need to garrison it. So we're going to need supplies from you. But he did it in a way that was very much like, like, like from the Honorable Lieutenant Colonel Ethan Allen of the New Hampshire Grants and the, this this kind of stuff just to really rub their noses in it. He he was sucking himself off is what he was doing. Yes. Yeah. Um, in this report, he used all of his writing skill and flowery language to emphasize the glorious victory that he had won. He conveniently failed to mention Arnold's involvement and gave himself all of the credit for commanding the attack. Does that surprise me? No. No. No, that that's a thing that most people who find themselves in command of a military unit would do just throughout history. And for Ethan and his kind of personality, it's just like like duh, of course of course it's exactly what he'd do. It's one hundred percent on brand for Ethan Allen. Yeah. And despite despite the butting heads, Ethan and Arnold were forced to reconcile out of necessity since now they weren't just in control of Fort Ticonderoga, but they were also in control of the fort at Crown Point a few miles away. So they once again divided their command to be able to manage their occupation of these this area. Arnold took a captured British sloop, which is just a type, it's a type of ship. He renamed this sloop that they had captured the Enterprise, which is... Uh, Scratching that weird Star Trek itch in the back of my head, but I'm sorry. I was about to say the only time I can hear the Enterprise and it be a ship is I think the Enterprise, even though the Enterprise wasn't even a glint in anyone's grandfather's eye. And I'm just imagining Benedict Arnold on the at the uh, at the wheel of this like 
little it's a warship but it's like a little dinky ship that's designed to sail on rivers and just like doing the picard thing where you're like and they took to arnold with spock yeah <laughs> he like throws his hand forward and does the picard thing where he says like uh make it so so yeah he took the ship the enterprise and he took a force north and went all the way up lake champlain up up the uh the richelieu river which was the the river feeding north uh like north out of lake champlain into quebec and captured fort saint john which was like five miles across the border into quebec so with that done the patriots the the revolutionaries, the Patriots, now control the entirety of the lake, of Lake Champlain, and they had a firm defensive position to push back a British invasion from Canada. Okay, solid. Yeah, from this point, Ethan got a hundred Green Mountain boys together and decided they were going to invade Canada. Does that sound crazy to you? The idea of invading Canada, even back then, yes. It that it, it's Ethan Allen that's doing it. No, no, <laughs> just but just like a hundred guys, um, but. Yeah, it, it sounds insane, and... I forget the Green Mountain Boys isn't very big either, though. Like, I keep on thinking, like, they're, like... For some reason, my brain's wanting to think of the Green Mountain Boys and the Revolutionary Armor as, like, interchangeable, but it, they're not. Yeah, the, the Green Mountain Boys, on paper, had, like, 2,000 members, but they only ever had, like, 100 members at most at a time. Maybe two or 300 if it was, like, something really important. But it never, their actual forces never got much bigger than about 100 guys. So, yeah, Ethan's getting 100 Green Mountain Boys together. and They're taking a nice little vacation up into Quebec. Naturally, that sounds insane. And Arnold said as much in his reports to the Continental Congress. But there was actually a reason for it. The committees of correspondence for both Connecticut and Massachusetts had given Ethan a secret mission. After the French and Indian War, about 3,000 merchants from New England had moved to Quebec, so there was a sizable number of Patriot sympathizers within Quebec City and Montreal themselves. He was going for reinforcements or trying to al gather allies or something? Yeah, he was trying to... Or support, like, s supplies? Yeah, so what was happening was um, uh, the, the Patriot sympathizers in Quebec at this point weren't getting involved with the rest of the colonies because um, Quebec, uh, Quebec is just a lot more isolated. You can't, it's not very easy to get anywhere over land. And a lot of it is a lot of the lifelines, like the supply lines for getting stuff that people need to survive in, in Quebec comes from the sea. So they're hesitant to get involved because they're afraid of cutting off their line to England because they're afraid if they do that, they're all going to starve. Yeah, they're in a really uh, delicate spot. They can be easily just like, oh, you're helping your enemy? Okay, you're cut off. Right, yeah. That that It's that easy to cripple them. Yeah, and then on top of that, they also all had, still had strong business interests in England, and none of them had been involved in any of the boycotts that the other uh, patriot groups, the the other, uh, like, like in all of the, the stamp acts and the... Uh, the towns and acts they hadn't gotten involved all the rebelling that kind of was happening already they had never gotten involved like when they protested the paper and all that the tea party they just yeah they were kind of well they may have sympathized they just were hands off yeah yeah so that that's basically what's what's happening but in spite of that though there was still an active uh committee of correspondence in montreal and there was the potential for Quebec to be included into this uh, coalition of colonies that were now revolting against the crown. Could you imagine that, though? What if they full on revolted and <laughs> Quebec was actually part of the U.S.? Yeah, there were. Yeah, there were several instances, especially early in the Revolutionary War, where it came very close to happening. Oh, I thought that was just like a far off thought for me like just like a random like oh what if i didn't think that was like deep had some grounding nope it it definitely had some grounding because the very first major campaign of the continental army is going to be an invasion of quebec with the intention of incorporating it into the revolution so it there was 
it was definitely a conscious thought that the founding fathers had and they had every intent of trying to bring quebec into the revolution but with ethan's little incursion into quebec it was the hope that of the patriots back in new england uh that uh this incursion into southern quebec could rouse the montreal patriots to join the cause and maybe bring some discontented french settlers on board as well because there's still a bunch of frenchmen there that were left over from when it was still a french colony and none of them liked the english well it's kind of obvious that there was a lot of french since there's french canada in canada i didn't i don't know the geography but it just kind of yeah of course you know yeah they're yeah the the quebec there's yeah there's still a population of french-speaking people that live along the saint lawrence river to this day the quebecois but yeah um the plan didn't work obviously. And only a few days into the invasion, they were ambushed by a detachment of Redcoats. There were no casualties, but Ethan and his lieutenants decided to pull back to an island on the Richelieu River called, this is some French, so bear with me, the Isle aux Noix. It's spelled I-L-E, second word, A-U-X, third word, N-O-I-X. You got way closer than I ever could, because I french i anything not in english i really get dyslexic because like i barely can get our, the way our phonetic is, are supposed to go and even if you're using the english alphabet with other languages it just brain no like work the eile aux noix that's what we're calling it yeah the the isle of noir was just on the border so ethan and his boys moved in and fortified it and of course, the Montreal Patriots were not roused to join the cause, and Quebec would never join the revolting colonies. By this point, I... You almost sound disappointed. I just think it'd be really funny to see an alternate history where French people were had a more active role to play in the development of the United States, just to see how fucked up we can make this country. <laughs> so it, it reminds... The way you phrase that reminds me a lot of the... Um, so I've been watching Futurama lately, and it reminds me of the what if episodes where it's like, what if this thing happened uh, in the Futurama series? And it's just like, I would love to see like an actual machine. I know it's impossible to do it that can use like actual science to figure out what if this timeline had gone this way, you know? <coughs> yeah. And there's just so many different variables, like so many individual people involved who get yeah. It, it would be impossible to calculate, especially this. But if it was like, oh, what if I decided to save my money since such and such age it would probably be easier to calculate on the what if machine. But like if it were real, but like, <laughs> yeah, that... let's get back to subject because that's not something probably even, feasible, you know, let's not let's not talk about like the uh, the nuances of of like real life time travel <laughs> or uh, like alternate alternate hit anyways multiverse yeah multiverse i I like to believe multiverse could be real i don't think it's a matter of being real i think i don't i don't know what i think about it i don't think about it but um yeah (laughs) you try not to worry about the big brain stuff i i worry about the right big big brain stuff at least the right big big brain stuff to me which is uh ethan allen and his green mountain boys which speaking of which by this point News of the capture of Ticonderoga and Crown Point had made it to all corners of the colonies. Many of the more conservative members of the Continental Congress were shocked and horrified by this news (laughs) because they had been trying to present the colonials as aggrieved, like an aggrieved class and merely defending themselves at Lexington and Concord. The Congress was still deliberating how to respond to the attack in Massachusetts when news of the fort's capture reached them, and it threw the Congress into disarray. They understood that they had to organize a military force to defend from future British reprisals, but they still wanted to keep the possibility of a peaceful resolution open. As a result, the response that they gave to Ethan was confusing and conflicting, and it absolutely enraged Ethan. No surprise here. Yeah, incompetence at the highest levels of power in the American state started at the very beginning. <laughs> there. Does that surprise me? It does not. The letter that they sent to Ethan congratulated him on a job well done. And then it told him that his orders were 
to take all of the cannon that they had captured and move their entire force south on the Hudson River to the southern edge of Lake George in eastern New York. Their orders were essentially to abandon all of the New Hampshire grants, most of northern New York, and not to mention all of the forts that they had just captured and were successfully holding. Ah, uh, I bet he was pissed. Yeah, he was He was not happy about it. Uh, one of the principal organizers of this absolutely insane comp because the the reason that this happened was because everybody of the Continental Congress disagreed with one another. You had one side that were uh, pushing, like especially from New England, that were pushing for more a, a more aggressive response to uh, the British Army, and then you had guys like the representatives from New York and Pennsylvania that were advocating for like a more tempered response with the intention of trying to restore peace and order uh, to the relationship between the colonies and Britain. And so this letter was a compromise between them. And just like every other compromise that the U S government has ever done, nobody was happy with it. And one of the principal organizers sounds about right. Yeah. One of the principal organizers of this compromise was happened to be one of the representatives from New York, our old buddy James Dwayne, one of the guys who had tried to bribe Ethan five years earlier. So Ethan and Arnold had been avoiding each other like the plague since they had captured Ticonderoga. Ethan was still shooting off letters to any person of importance in the colonies, uh, taking credit for the capture of the forts. And Arnold was telling anybody who had listened about Ethan's aborted incursion into Canada and his loss of Fort St. John. When they did speak to each other, it was almost always in the form of an argument. But they did agree on one thing. Giving up the forts was idiotic beyond all comprehension. Also, to Arnold's credit, it the vibe that I'm going to be giving off of this episode is running a lot of defense for Benedict Arnold, which I don't think he gets enough of. Because I... I have no opinions on the man personally or the things that he did. He's a historical figure. He did some stuff. I'm not going to get mad at a guy who betrayed this country 250 years ago, but just as like his actual story, I will like push back on a lot of the reputation that he has as like a traitor to the continental cause. Oh, that's just historical anger. That was just the, revolutionaries being petty to be honest i bet yeah like you told me he doesn't really help the british all that much does he like in the grander scheme of things once he betrays them um he fights on he's like not utilized you said something about that yeah he he fights for them in like a minor role he leads a few battles against the continental army in like the later stages of the war uh but yeah he didn't do much for the british actually because his big supposed betrayal ended before it started, which I'm gonna I'm gonna get into later. So uh, I'll t- I'll talk about that when we get to it. But but yeah, to, to Arnold's credit, he did seem to have like a genuine concern for the well being of the settlers of the New Hampshire grants, and he thought the idea of leaving them to the mercy of the Redcoats, who the the British knew full well once once they came into the New Hampshire grants, it was all of these women and children that were left behind while they're they're men were off in the militia there were going to be reprisals like they're they're going to start of course there's going to be yeah they're going to start getting back at the families of the green mountain boys for in in revenge for taking ticonderoga because that was a really big deal and it it really bruised the honor of the continental british army and so like there would definitely be like some bad stuff happening to the families of the Green Mountain Boys if they just up and left the New Hampshire grants. So Arnold shot off his own letter to the Congress. Interestingly, in this letter, he referred to himself as the Colonel of Ticonderoga. So now he's trying to take credit for taking the fort. And in this letter, he basically said, nah, I thought he already took credit for it. He was taking credit for it, but I just wanted to point out like like how he was doing it and to it it wasn't as effective as how Arnold was doing it because Arnold beat him to the uh Arnold beat ba- basically beat him to the punch and got the message out faster than Benedict could. Uh but this letter basically just said, nah, that's a bad idea. 
Instead, we're going to push up and we're going to secure the northern coast of Lake Champlain and we're going to defend from the British there. So that was that was Benedict's idea. That's what he wanted to do. On June 10th, Benedict took his ship north up the lake to inspect the fort garrisons along the coast. So they had been starting to build these fortifications along the coast, all up and down uh, Lake Champlain. Uh, and he was preparing for the big push that would establish the defensive position along the northern end of the coast uh, against the Redcoats who would try to come down from Quebec. While he did that, Ethan was exerting his authority in Arnold's absence and called for a council of war with the commanders and captains of both the Green Mountain Boys and Arnold's militia. At this council, they decided independently of Arnold's same decision that he was currently trying to put into effect, they decided also to ignore the Continental Congress's orders and launch another attack on Fort St. John. They also elected for Ethan. So they were saying, screw it. They... Yeah, they were saying, they were saying, screw it, but they were saying, screw it in such a way that they could leave Benedict out of it because they didn't want him there. <laughs> um, what, did that include his own men? Um, you said his, it was with his own men too. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like I'm not sure on the specifics, but it sure does seem like that, which is kind of confusing because it did it. The sources don't really talk about like his men having any prior animosity towards him or anything. The only guess I could be is that even if Benedict disagreed with the Continental Congress, he was going to listen to him until he convinced him otherwise. And maybe his men wasn't down for that. That's the only guess i have no um benedict at this point at this point the um he wasn't actually like obligated to follow the orders of the continental congress because the congress was not the one who had commissioned him as an officer his commission was through the government of massachusetts and so when the continental congress starts sending out orders quote unquote they're not really orders at this point because they don't really have the authority to do that yet. So it was more like a rec recommendation phrase as an order. They didn't really have authority until we got to the, um, the articles of confederation, right? Well, no, in as far as the war goes, they didn't get authority until they built their own army, which was the continental army. Okay. So the con the Continental Army doesn't exist yet because the war just started like two weeks ago. And it would be another month or so before that even becomes like a real idea. Um, uh, let's see, where were we? Oh, yeah. So another thing that this council did was they recommended that Ethan, Remember Baker, and Seth Warner all personally travel to Philadelphia and present their decision to the Continental Congress in person. So after finding out about this trip that Ethan was about to take, uh, Benedict Arnold, of course, he flew into a wild rage because he was now being left out of all of the decision making. And this wild rage culminated in him bashing one of his lieutenants over the head with the hilt of his saber, which is... Uh, both for normal people and in the mili in the military customs of the 18th century, really big no no, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. Um. You didn't. Uh. Uh. In 18th century armies, commanders were allowed to strike their subordinates, but if your subordinate was an officer, just like a junior officer, then you weren't. It was extremely disrespectful to strike them in front of other soldiers. If you're going to beat the shit out of one of your subordinates for doing something wrong, you take them into a back room and then you beat the shit out of them and let them walk out with like all their clothes torn and they got a black eye and stuff. You do not do it in front of other officers because that lowers morale and it, it disturbs discipline and it break, it breaks decorum. It's just a very, very out of line thing for an officer to do. In, at this time it's funny that they had were, were these like the unspoken rules i guess yeah these these are that were so like well known i guess yeah like like when people start getting mad at benedict for doing this they're gonna say it's completely wrong that you beat one of your subordinates when really what they actually mean is it is completely wrong that you beat one of your subordinates in front of your other subordinates 
Well, it seems like there's a lot of that through history. Uh, we're not mad that you did it. We're mad that you did it the way you did it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Kind of stuff. That, that happens a lot throughout history, I think. Yeah, that's exactly it. But yeah, so when uh, Benedict had actually uh, walked in on the council, that council of war as it was still going on, but he arrived just at the tail end of it right as they were get, leave, getting out and found out what they were doing. Uh, that council of war would be the last time that Ethan and Benedict ever saw each other for the rest of their lives. Interesting. I'll tell you briefly what happened to Benedict Arnold after his six week adventure with Ethan Allen. All of the letters that Ethan had been sending, especially to the Continental Congress, had spread the message that Arnold was erratic and acted poorly under fire. That, along with outrage at him striking one of his subordinates, established his reputation as violent and power hungry. So basically his running with Ethan Allen uh, ruined his reputation for the rest of his quote unquote American career. Yes, exactly. And even though he had George Washington's full support, George Washington was the only guy in the entire Continental Army who liked Benedict. And that's the only reason he wasn't just kicked out of the army immediately. Um, But despite that support, he would never be seen as an effective commander, either in the eyes of the army or in the eyes of the Congress. He would go on to command part uh, one part of the invasion of the later invasion of Quebec. But due, due to Congress's budgetary concerns at the time, the army he led was undersupplied, and the invasion ultimately the invasion ultimately failed to capture Quebec. Of course. But thanks to Arnold's leadership, that army made it out of Canada in one piece and was able to fight again. Live to fight another day, huh? He would then go on to lead the Continental Army at the Battle of Saratoga, where he was severely wounded in the leg and he would walk with a limp for the rest of his life. Good old Gimpy. Yeah, he was Gimpy. Uh, Saratoga was one of the most important battles of the war because the American victory at Saratoga destroyed the British army under General John Burgoyne, uh, which was the, the army, the British army in Quebec. It was all of the British army in like the northern part of the colonies. And it just got wiped off the map in a day. Thanks in large part to the leadership of Benedict Arnold. Interesting. And on top of that, the victory, the victory at Saratoga convinced the French to uh, join the war on the side of the American cause and declare war on Britain and start giving uh, military aid to the Continental Army, which was a huge reason why America won the Revolutionary War. Oh yeah, it's in my classes. It always focused that once the French got involved, that really was. I don't know if I want to say turning point, but it was a major factor in us actually being able to win. Yeah, yeah, and it. I wouldn't quite call it a turning point because, like, the closest that uh, the colonies ever got to defeat was after the French joined, like in 1780, but. Uh, it we the the Americans would not have been able to win if it had not been for the intervention of the French. It just would not have happened. I'm I'm not surprised to be perfectly honest. We were going up to a much better supplied country. We were going up just a better skilled. Yes, guerrilla warfare can help you a lot, and home field advantage is a real thing. But at the end of the day, the British military was just like superior in every way it could be every way that mattered uh if we were just putting each other against each other from one side to the other you know yeah like the thing with that is um if you're looking at it just from like the perspective of just raw military data then yeah the british had a better army than the continental army but when you look at some of the more intangible stuff stuff like the fact that uh they were fighting on they were basically fighting in the soldiers' backyards. They knew the land and the climate and how to navigate it significantly better than the British Army. When you take into account the fact that most of the British soldiers were raised in cities back in back in England and had no experience with guns, whereas all of the Continental Army had been 
raised with guns since they were toddlers. Americans, we've loved our guns since the beginning. Oh yeah, there's there's a reason guns are so popular in America, and it's it's because it's been a an ingrained part of survival for like to live on this continent for hundreds of years you had to own and know how to use a gun that's that's just where it comes from but but yeah it's so like it's some of that more intangible stuff that really made the difference in why the americans were able to do so well so many times against what should have been a better trained and better drilled army despite all of benedict arnold's successes and everything that he gave to the Patriot cause, including the use of one of his legs, the Congress still passed him up for promotion over and over again. And he was not paid. They refused to pay him. They let him keep the commission because that's what George Washington wanted, but they refused to pay him. He did not get paid for his service during the Revolutionary War. They were paying soldiers at that time? Yeah. I thought it was like a fight or we are pressed still thing. No, it, it that, that's it. That's almost never how it works. It, that's that's very much like a movie invention. Every uh, every army with a structure like the Continental Armies uh, relies on paying their soldiers and having higher pay for higher ranks as a motivation for like rank rank advancement and things like that. Um, Okay. So yeah, everybody in the Continental Army was paid. At least they were supposed to be paid. A lot of times they weren't because the Continental Congress was always chronically short on cash. But um, but yeah, like everybody who like all of the enlisted guys, all of the privates and corporals, uh, they all enlisted for a term of for a term that they would be receiving a pay like a standardized pay for, and then each rank, uh every person enlisted or commissioned officer uh, received like a regular pay based on their rank for a Lieutenant Colonel. It was like 200 pounds a year, which 200 pounds. It's a several thousand, several thousand dollars. So it wasn't a lot of money, but it was enough to motivate people. I mean, it's a lot more than I thought to be perfectly honest. Yeah. Like it, I, I, I assumed it was like movie invention kind of stuff it it's you do it for the good of your fellow people who are being oppressed kind of stuff and it, it makes sense it's not but i've just never never sat and thought about it you know yeah that there was there was definitely like like the two aren't mutually exclusive like there's definitely an ideological component to why many if not most of the soldiers in the continental army chose to join uh but it yeah you can't you can't have an army like a modern struck like a modern army with like a, sh- a structured chain of command without some sort of pay system, especially when it's when they're like out on campaign and they're away from their uh, primary like primary source of income. Like a lot, a lot of the people, a lot of the guys in the Continental Army were farmers. When they're out on campaign, they can't be back home tending their farms, so they can't be making a profit off of their produce which means that their family isn't making money and they end up starving. So even if somebody is ideologically dedicated to the cause of the revolution, the fact that if they leave to go fight the revolution means that their family will starve is a big motive would be a big motivator not to join. So does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. It's another one of those things that you just never sat and reconciled in your brain for me, I guess Like it makes total sense that they got paid. Yeah. So as Benedict was, later recovering from his leg wound washington appointed him as the military governor of philadelphia which at that time had been occupied by the british but had recently been liberated back by the continental army and while he was there he met and married a woman named peggy shippen who happened to be a loyalist Uh oh due to his frustration at the continental army or to with the continental congress and Partially because of that, partially because this was the point of, of the war where everybody was becoming very disillusioned it was, and it was looking like the Patriots were going to lose. And partially because of the influence from his new wife, who was this hot, like hot 18 year old blonde from a rich family. And he was like 44 or 45 at the time. 
So yeah, there's there's more of that age gap. Disgusting. <laughs> because of all of these factors, it was about that time that he started to become disillusioned with the Patriot cause. And then right around the same time, Washington finally twisted enough arms to get Arnold a promotion right at the time that he didn't want it anymore. And so he turned it down. And instead, he requested a posting as the commander of the fortification at West Point in New York. And that was because the reason he wanted that posting was because at some point in 1780, he had been contacted by the leader of the British spy network, a guy named Major John Andre who made a deal for Arnold to come under the British Army's protection if he surrendered West Point to the British. And he agreed to the deal. But before the plan could go into effect, Andre was captured by the Continental Army, and he was executed. Oh, damn. Yeah. When he was captured, he was carrying a letter from Benedict Arnold that outlined their entire plan in his boot. So when they took this guy's boots off, they found the letter that implicated Benedict Arnold. And this is a crazy story. Benedict was actually at Mount Vernon in Virginia, where he was going to have dinner or he was going to have breakfast with George Washington. Uh, Mount Vernon was George Washington's house. I've I've been to the museum thingy. Yeah. Yeah. And so he was literally like waiting in the parlor of George Washington's house when a courier came by looking for Washington saying that uh, Andre had been executed and Benedict was a traitor. The courier didn't recognize Benedict as being Benedict. And so, and so Arnold told this courier that he'd relay the message and he got the message and found out that his cover's blown. And now he's standing in the parlor of the leader of the army that he is betraying right at that moment washington pulls up to in the front drive in the front driveway of his manor of his mansion house in his carriage benedict panics and jumps out his window he was sweating balls. He manages to escape. He flees to uh, he flees to the coast, and he's picked up by a British ship. He ended up fighting for the British Army for the rest of the war. He fought a few like minor skirmishes down in like the Carolinas, I think, and then the British lost the war a couple years later. That's kind of anticlimactic for him compared to what I the history books made it out to be. Yeah. Um, and it was it was this big wild thing because he wasn't well liked by most of the people in power, but you know he was he was like moderately popular as like a war hero amongst like the general population, and he was still one of the most visual one of the guys that everybody saw because he was always at Washington's right hand, so everybody knew who he was, and then everybody and then the news came out that he had betrayed the Continental Army. And everybody lost their minds. And and it just it that that just rabid anger and hatred just kind of got cemented into the collective psyche of American culture from that point on. And it just kind of never went away. So whenever we hear the name Benedict Arnold, we associate that with like the worst kind of vile, traitorous scum of the earth. But um, yeah, so after that, he moved back to England uh, he failed at a bunch of different business ventures. He failed in politics. He got deep into debt. And then he died from gout in 1801. That is a... He regretted his betrayal of the Continental Cong- of the Continental Army until the day that he died. Well, it was kind of a flaccid betrayal, too. I bet you if nothing really came about your betrayal, you'd be sad, too, that you... You put all this work into like, okay, they're not appreciating me. I'll might as well join the other team. And then that plan doesn't fulfill. And now you just wasted your shot with one because it's not really. Yeah. And it's anything, you know, like, yeah, like he, he had, he genuinely believed in the American cause. He gave so much to that cause so much of his life and his existence to the cause but at the end he let his own ambition and disappointment override his desire to see that cause through honestly i'm a little bit surprised 
I'm thinking probably not realistic wise, but like it would have been interesting if he tried to spin it like, no, I was doing a double agent move or whatever. Like I was trying to pretend to betray. Uh, no, nobody would have. It, they wouldn't have believed it. Nobody would have. At least the the important people would not have believed it. Like as soon as the Continental Congress, who all hated him, heard that he had been talking to a British spy, he would have swung from a rope. Like there, there was no doubt about it. Uh, there's there's one story that says it's probably apocryphal and didn't happen, but it's a story that's told that says that on his deathbed, he requested to be buried in his Continental Army uniform. I feel like if I was in his shoes, even if I regretted it, I wouldn't have... I'd feel too ashamed to at request that, you know? Yeah, and you gotta you gotta imagine, like, the position he was in later in his life after it had all happened, because he was constantly sick from all of the injuries and sicknesses that he had had fighting in the Revolutionary War that plagued him and for the rest of his life. Um, he re- not only did he regret betraying the, the Continental Continental Army, but he also didn't get anything out of it at the end of the day, because at the time when he was living in England, ev- everybody in England hated him. So he traded in everybody in America hating him, but he was fighting for a cause he believed in to everybody in England hates him, but he was fighting for a cause he didn't believe in. And the reason everybody in England hated him was because the the Tories, the conservatives, didn't trust him because because he was already an established turncoat and because they thought that he should have died instead of John Andre, who was a national hero. And a lot of the more liberal people in England and like the common people hated him because he betrayed the continental cause, which interestingly enough a lot of people in england did support i never thought of that like the average english citizens view on the revolution we're going to talk about that a little bit later in the story and i'm very excited to talk about it because it is fascinating but uh let's get to that point first yeah so think think about it if it had not been for his rivalry with Ethan Allen, Benedict Arnold might be considered today one of America's greatest heroes. Ethan Allen set all of it in motion. That's crazy. He bullied this man until he did something that made him, made his name synonymous with traitors for all of, for the rest of history, for the rest of time. He bullied a man into that position. At least American history. I mean, yes, he was a, traitor but like is he really that well known historically outside of america yeah yeah probably not probably not but you get my you get my point i get what you're saying it's just like it feels really niche but like yeah i'm surprised he's as well known looking back on what actually happened um i think at least it almost feels like that should be like the story oh this dumbass did this thing and it not as like emphasized as we do it now which is it's kind of crazy. It, it's as emphasized as it is. I think he should be. I think as long like if if you have any interest or your or if American history is, is at all relevant to somebody, they should know about Benedict Arnold, but not just that he was a traitor, but for all of the other stuff he did as well. I think that's I think that's really what it comes down to. Yeah, that's that is my defense of Benedict Arnold. I do genuinely believe he was screwed over by the Continental Congress and that motivated him to betray the Congress when it was combined with his natural tr- like personality that trended towards ambition. So that that is my lukewarm defense of Benedict Arnold. Anyways, it was late June 1775. Ethan and his subcommanders who were all also his cousins sailed south down the river on their way to Philadelphia. On the way there, they received news about a terrible battle that had just been fought near Boston, confirming once and for all that the colonies in their mother country were undeniably really, really, really actually at war. It wasn't just skirmishes or taking old forts. Pitched battles were now happening. As the con- at the same time the Continental Congress was approving the formation of the Continental Army, 
and was appointing George Washington as its commander in chief, 15,000 volunteers were massed around Boston, ready to take it back from British occupation. A group of 1,300 Massachusetts and New Hampshire's militia began to build fortification on a hill overlooking both the city and the harbor where the British ships had their cannons pointed towards the city, called Breed's Hill. On the morning of June 17th, the ships opened up, opened up fire on the hill, and in the afternoon, British General Howe ordered his redcoats forward. The American colonel who was commanding the forces on that day, Israel Putnam, gave the orders, don't fire till you see the whites of their eyes. The Americans held off wave after wave of British troops, but eventually they ran out of ammunition and Howe's troops were able to launch a successful bayonet charge that dislodged the Americans and scattered their force. Even though technically what came to be called the Battle of Bunker Hill, for some reason, I have no idea why, Bunker Hill was a different hill that was right next to Breed's Hill, but it was not where the fighting happened. It happened on Breed's Hill. Even though technically what came to be called the Battle of Bunker Hill was a victory for the British, it remains to this day one of the most Pyrrhic victories in British military history. The Americans suffered 140 dead, 301 wounded, and 30 captured. The British, on the other hand, suffered almost 300 killed, including two of their commanders, and almost 800 wounded. Out of a force of 2,000, the British suffered 1,054 killed and wounded, over 50% casualty rate. That's insane. One in every two men in that force was either killed or shot in some part of their body. And there's a really interesting aspect to it. A lot of those British, British troops at Bunker Hill were shot in the groin. Because, because <laughs> the Americans were specifically aiming for their groins. Why does that feel like a very American thing to do? It's a very American thing to do, not just because it's symbolic, but also because it's practical. If you shoot a man in the arm or the leg or the chest and he survives, he has the potential to bounce back from it and continue fighting, however slim it is. If you shoot a man's nuts off, he is never coming back from that. No, not really. If you shoot a man's nuts off, you are never going to convince him to get on a battlefield again. There's no way. But Ethan, Remember, and Seth arrived in Philadelphia on June 23rd. While in the city, Ethan took the time to catch up with his old friend uh, from Salisbury, Dr. Thomas Young. Our old boy is back. By that time, Dr. Young was the most prominent leader amongst the most radical faction of the new revolutionary government who a group at the time were called the independents who were called because they were already at the point of advocating for a full break with England. This was a over a year before the declaration of independence would be signed. Dr. Young introduced Ethan to a friend of his and a fellow radical that most everybody listening, at least most of every American listening to this has heard of named Thomas Paine who was the greatest propagandist of the American Revolution and the writer of the famous pamphlet, Common Sense. Payne was very impressed by Ethan. And later on, when e Ethan later on would write a whole bunch of philosophy, and Ethan's writings would inspire many of Payne's most important essays on politics. Interesting. Yeah, Ethan inspired one of the most radical men. I've never really heard anything about Thomas Paine other than his, um, the Federalist, was it the Federalist Papers or Common, Common Sense? Sense? No, he didn't have anything to do with the Federalist Papers. But um, yeah, Payne was, uh, he had actually just arrived in Pennsylvania just a couple months before Lexington and Concord. And he was running away from England because he literally couldn't hold down a job over there. Every time he tried to do something in the private sector, his business would go under and every time he tried to do something in the public sector he'd keep getting fired because he'd always talk about how much he hated the king and so he he decided to move to philadelphia and start writing for one of the radical newspapers in the colonies which i, I can't remember what it's called now but it was it was the journal that uh uh that benjamin franklin wrote and published or, that published and sold so he was 
he was there writing articles for uh, Benjamin Franklin's uh, journal when the Revolutionary War broke out. And he immediately hopped in to the local political scene and started spreading all of the most radical ideas he possibly could. I, I mean, it makes sense given what we know about Thomas Paine. What little we know. Yeah, after after the Revolutionary War, he would actually, he would receive uh, citizenship in the United States, but I don't think he ever lived in the United States again after the Revolutionary War because uh, right after that, um, I think he went back to England and started being like a political agitator again. Uh, and at some point when the French Revolution broke out, he went over there and started to become a political organizer for the French revolutionaries. So he was always on the forefront of like stirring the pot for revolutions, basically. Yes, he was. He was a shit stirrer in every country that he landed in. And I love him for it. But so, yeah, that that's the kind of guy that Thomas Paine was uh, a guy who dedicated his entire life to fighting authority wherever he found it. And he was he would later be directly inspired by Ethan Allen's writings. It's kind of crazy. Um, I know you said he was educated and that he did philosophy stuff, but I still can't think of him any as anything other than like kind of a good old boy. Like, yeah, I'll fight them bloody damn British. Yeah, he's he is the classic stereotype. Well, he that's the weird thing is he fits so many of the classic stereotypes of the revolutionary period. He was like a hick backcountry farmer, but he was also like a genteel Yale, like like Ivy League or almost Ivy League educated intellectual of of the Enlightenment school. And he was also like a dashing, brave, heroic soldier. And he was also like a greedy capitalist land speculator. He fits so many of the stereotypes of the time all into one person. It's crazy. He is the embodiment of everything going on at the time. And it's fascinating. So, uh, yeah, he, he went and he went, he went to the state house in Philadelphia where the Continental Congress was meeting. At the time, Congress was still reckoning with the bloodbath at Bunker Hill. It had just happened. And they were still like, what the fuck do we do now? What happens now? So Ethan walks in and half of the assembly stands up and gives him a standing ovation. Of course, with the exception of the delegation from New York, who object to the Congress recognizing a criminal outlaw and allowing him to speak. But they do. And he speaks to the Congress about the situation around Lake Champlain, explaining how they were holding the British at bay from Canada, but that they wouldn't last long without weapons and supplies from Congress. He also said that the only way the colonies could defend their northern border was with a full-scale invasion of Quebec in order to unseat the British administration and the governor of Quebec, a guy named, I just said, I just said, I promised myself I wouldn't say it, a guy named Guy Carlton. His first name is Guy. That is such a stupid first name. Oh, are we doing a shot for that? I wasn't going to do a shot for it, but if the if our liquor commissioner i i don't think it's guy is a name that is not normal but it is a normal name i'm gonna go ahead and say do the shot because of the way i reacted but like i don't think it's as out there you know as some of the other stuff yeah if it was the first time i'd ever read it uh i would have been really like confused about the name but just because of the fact that i've seen it before I mean, no, I've never met anybody who has it, but like people throughout history, I've seen the name come up before. I also watched Naruto, so Guy Sensei is just, it's Guy Sensei. <laughs> I'm used to that name. Weeb, weeb. All right, Prost. Cheers. It was Ethan Allen who first planted the idea to invade Quebec into the minds of the Continental Congress. So literally the very... How often did they try and invade Quebec during the revolution? Because that's not something that I have really seen talk about, really. Like, I didn't even know that was really a thing. Uh, they tried twice, and both attempts failed before 1777. So within, like, the first couple years of the war, they tried twice, and both times failed. And they didn't try it again, because it turned out to be a pretty bad idea to try and invade the 
backcountry bumfuck wilderness of uh 18th century canada it, it was a mess um but yeah it like they did try it twice both in like the earliest earliest stages of the war but yeah so congress accepted his proposal despite the misgivings of some of the more conservative representatives and plans were made for the newly appointed commander of the northern department a new york landlord named philip Scheuler. now i pointed that out for a reason a new york landlord was the commander of the northern department so yeah they they commissioned him to make preparations to assemble an invasion force at crown point in addition to that the congress officially recognized and incorporated the green mountain boys as a regiment in the Continental Army. And they recognized they recognized its commander, Ethan Allen, as its official commander, and he was given a commission as a lieutenant colonel with full pay. And he was put under the command of Philip Schroeder, a man who considered him at the absolute scum of the earth, but would now have to treat him with all of the respect due to an officer. I bet you that grind his ears. Ethan would look back at this meeting with the Congress as one of the greatest successes of his life. Oh, wow. He got recognized as a hero. He got a prestigious and well-paying new job. And he got to say fuck you to New York all in one day. I mean, when you look at it from that angle, yes, that makes total sense. Yeah. And also because he was now officially a commissioned officer in the Continental Army, he was now under the protection of the continent of the authority of the Continental Congress, which at this point it had been accepted, supersedes the authority of the state governments for the duration of the war. And so New York would not be able to prosecute Ethan. Even he could walk into the state house in Albany, New York, while they're in session, spit on the floor and flip them off, and they would not be able to do anything about it. <laughs> He'd basically been given basically immunity. Yeah, he he was given immunity from all of these maniac landlords who wanted his head on a pike. And and now he was more beloved and renowned than any single one of them. Just more popular, had more sway, just was proving himself to be a better person in every possible way than any of those assholes in New York. And he is loving every second of it. Unfortunately for him, his satisfaction would be short-lived. Before he could make it back to Ticonderoga, he found out that his command of the forts had been transferred to the commander of a force from New Hampshire. So it was now the new a regiment from New Hampshire that was garrisoning the fort and the Green Mountain Boys had been sent home. So he doesn't have the forts anymore, but that's like, okay, whatever. It, it was going to happen. It's no big deal. Then when he made it back to Bennington, he received some world-shattering news. So, Which was? I'll explain it. The commission that he had received as the commander of the Green Mountain Boys, it, they did recognize him as the commander of the regiment of Green Mountain Boys within the Continental Army, but they required that his regiment be commissioned through a particular state. And they decided just to try and smooth things over and to keep and just to pretend that they were still recognizing New York's claims to the New Hampshire grants. They told the, uh, they told New York that New York would have the right to incorporate this regiment as one of their state regiments. Ah, he felt pissed. Well, that wasn't a big deal to him. That, that particular part, he knew that was going to happen and he didn't think it was a big deal because even though it was registered through Albany, New York still wouldn't have any like authority over them. So it was just it was just bureaucratic paperwork or so he thought. The thing was when the commission went through and was registered in New York, the commission that they drafted stipulated in accordance with the traditions of New England militia regiments that the commander of the regiment would have to be elected. Oh, shit. And so even though the Continental Congress gave him his rank and recognized him as the commander of the regiment, now the regiment had to have an election to confirm him as the commander. When he got back to Bennington... That's so shitty of them. When he got back to Bennington, he found out 
that um, the town elders of all of the townships of Vermont had come together and had voted for Seth Warner as the commander of the Green Mountain Boys. And Ethan had not received any, had been not been elected to any of the positions within the regiment. He had just been shit on, basically. Legal, legally speaking, for all intents and purposes, he was no longer a member of the militia and the regiment that he founded. Oh, fuck. Before he even got a chance to command them. That is so messed up. And that's... That's really confusing when you first hear about it, because why didn't the settlers of Vermont or the New Hampshire grants, why didn't they vote for him? He was already like their popular leader. There's there was some fuckery going on. So technically, what as it was implied in the charter for the regiment, it would he would be elected in compliance with the traditions of New England, New England militias. But in New England militias, the commander is elected by his subordinates in, within the unit itself. But this election had not been done through the militia. It had been done through a convention of the town elders who, so the actual legal, ju- like the actual legal justification that they had to do that election is very shaky and questionable. Of course. Um, and, but the reason that, the the other thing is that the reason that all of these all of these town elders essentially all of these old men from all across the New Hampshire grants had voted to not include him as the commander of the Green Mountain Boys was because they were a faction of the more conservative parts of the of the settlers they were the more conservative settlers of course and they they were still trying to find a peaceful resolution to the land dispute with New York. And on top of that, they were still trying to maintain their, their settlement as legal in the eyes of the crown. So Ethan Allen, not only had, isn't it, hold on. Isn't it a bit late for them to be worrying about legality with the crown? Like even this far, you've got to be like, this far and like no it's it's done we're rebelling yeah it is way past that but as we all know conservatives are really hard at accepting reality as it is it's really hard for them to accept reality as it exists (laughs) no um they the thing was a lot of these guys were loyalists they didn't support the patriot cause they still believed in the uh the authority of the crown and didn't support this war that was happening and and they thought that uh, Ethan's offensive actions against both New York and against Ticonderoga was going to bring the wrath of the king's armies down on the heads of the Green Mountain settlers. And so that is why they sort of elect they sort of designated themselves to elect the the commanders for the regiment and decided to completely exclude ethan allen from leadership and they went with remember baker or i mean not remember baker they went with seth warner because he was a little bit more conservative he wasn't a loyalist but he was more level-headed and less reckless and just out trying to trying to cause trouble with the british than ethan was and so they liked they they thought seth was a better choice and so for the rest, for the entirety of the Revolutionary War, the official name of the Green Mountain Boys, as it appears in like official military documentation, it was referred to as Warner's Regiment. That shit. That is like so fucked. Yeah, it's real horse shit. It's, it's real bad. It's not good. <laughs> um, e- Ethan was understandably upset at this turn of events. He responded to it by trying to get into a fist fight with Seth Warner. Or not by trying to. He, he had a fist fight with Seth Warner. Can you blame the guy? I mean, can you blame him at that point? It, it was a setup. It was a setup. Yeah, it was a setup. And on top of that, Seth wasn't involved with the setup, but he did accept the results of it. I feel like Seth had to know it was a setup, though. I feel like he had to. Yeah, it, it was obvious to everybody like exactly what had happened. Uh, but Seth was Seth kind of agreed with those town elders. He kind of thought that Ethan was a little reckless 
he was loyal to Ethan and he loved Ethan because they were family, but he just genuinely thought Ethan was too reckless to lead them. And he put his trust into uh, the town elders who had elected him. And so he refused to relinquish his, his newly elected position. So yeah, he got into a fist fight with Warner and then when that accomplished nothing, he left and he went to, he crawled out to Albany and met with General Schuyler and he requested a command. He requested that General Schuyler give him a command of a unit. And Schuyler, who thought that Ethan was the scum of the earth, said, absolutely not. Get out of my office. Who is Schuyler? Philip Schuyler is the New York landlord who had just been named the commander of the Continental Army's Northern Department. Oh, okay. The only person who outranks him in the Continental Army is George Washington. Schuyler said no to Ethan. And then he came back with a second offer and he sold Schuyler. I will serve in any position in any part of this army with or without pay. Just put me somewhere where I can be useful. So he's like, I will do anything you tell me to do. Just use me. Yeah. Um, and so Schuyler, sick and tired of this guy, assigns him to scouting duty for the army as it pushes up north into Quebec. Quick question. Did he do it for no pay? No, he still got pay. He because he okay. That was my like. Did the, did Schuler actually make him do it without pay? Was my biggest question. No, it the with or without pay thing was kind of just theatrical, because even though he wasn't elected to um to command the Green Mountain Boys, he's already got his commission. He's going to receive the pay regardless of whether or not he's actually doing anything, or whether he's, whether or not he's actually commanding a unit. He's got the commission. He's on the paperwork. Wait, so he would get he would get the, he's going to get the pay because he's commissioned no matter what. That's weird. If he's not got like an official position, why would he get paid? Uh, because he still held the rank on the paperwork. He was still on the roster of the Continental Armies, even if he didn't have a command or a position within the army. If he's still on the if he's still on the muster and his that muster is still going to the paymaster with his uh with his rank the paymaster is still sending that check out uh, i guess that makes sense i just yeah so ethan could have ethan could have just gone back to his home in bennington and not do anything and just collected checks from the continental congress uh unt for however long it took them to realize he wasn't actually doing anything and they took him off the muster that that kind of says a little bit like not much about his character, but a little bit about his character to say, no, I, 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 I need to do something. Yeah, like it, he genuinely cared about this cause like it, like he was red blooded American through and through at this point before that was even really a thing. Well, before it was an actual thing. Yeah. Schuyler appointed him to scout and also gave him the secondary mission of talking to local settlers throughout Quebec and seeing if he can recruit any of them to the army, uh, which he was actually pretty successful with by the time he gets to this big important event that we're going to be talking about shortly. Uh, he recruit recruits something like 400 uh, Canadians, like French and British settlers uh, to the continental army. It's actually really impressive. Either he's a really He's he is a really good talker, but either he's really good at talking to these people or they just all really fucking hate the British. Crazy how many people he recruits just by going out and talking to them. But anyways, so now Ethan is heading north with an army preparing to invade Quebec. The there's this operation that literally he personally had gotten the Continental Congress to agree to. This whole thing was his idea. And now he's just a scout in it. <laughs> That's crazy. He went from leading people to just being, oh, I'm the guy who goes to see if everything is ready for us to attack. This is all this is all happening in less than two weeks. In less than two weeks, he becomes the greatest, like most up and coming hero of the blossoming American Revolution to to practically a nobody in the rank structure of the Continental Army in less than two weeks. It's such a meteoric fall. That's, I, okay, I'm surprised it only took two weeks. I would have thought the travel to go see 
whoever it was he begged again. What was his name? Uh, Schweiler. At which Schweiler at that Schweiler. I would have thought the Schweiler thing would have taken longer than two weeks because of how slow travel was back then. Well, it he was in Albany, which is only like which is only like a day's ride from Bennington by horse. So and then from Philadelphia, from Vermont to Philadelphia is by horse is probably only a few days. So so it's not a it it it's a it's longer than we'd than we would have to do today with cars and stuff. But they had good enough roads and they had horses. It with it the distances we're talking about are pretty far, but they're not as far as like like we think they are. I no, I just assumed Schuler was like probably a state or more away. So I assumed it would have taken a little bit. No, because they're they're organizing this entire invasion like on Lake Champlain. Okay, interesting. That Lake Champlain is the launching off point, which is like the western border of Vermont. So they were all kind of centrally located. I was assuming it was all spread out. No, it's no, they're all like the they're all con- they're concentrating their f- forces for one big push. Uh first they're going to go after uh uh Fort St. Jean and then they're going to hit Montreal and they're, then they're going to hit Quebec city and they need their entire force concentrated to hit each point. That makes a whole lot of sense. So the first American campaign of the war was launched in September of 1775, four months after the capture of Fort Ticonderoga, an invasion up the Richelieu river to capture the province of Quebec. Shortly after the invasion began, Ethan received yet more terrible news. We're going back to our Frederick the Great, uh, and then and then he got more bad news sort of situation. <laughs> so back in August, a French Canadian militia captain was leading a party of Mohawk warriors to scout the border of the New Hampshire grants, and they stumbled upon a seemingly abandoned canoe. Naturally, they figured, hey, free canoe, and they started to take it. As it turns out, the canoe belonged to a scouting party of Green Mountain Boys who immediately started yelling at them to give the boat back. The Mohawk warriors responded by firing their muskets at the boys, who then ran away. The next day, the Mohawk scouting party came back and discovered in the underbrush the body of Captain Remember Baker, dead from a shot to the head. So, Remember Baker is Ethan's cousin and best friend in the entire world since they were little kids, is now dead. That's a sip. Honestly, I'm going to do two. I know it doesn't really matter, but like I was getting kind of attached to remember Baker as dumb as his name is, but like, yeah, I was too. He was a badass, at, and he was loyal. He, he seemed like a really cool guy. Honestly, he last, he lasted longer than I kind of thought in relevancy. At least I expected him to pitter out once we got into the civil war or earlier, because I didn't think his cousin would do anything. Revolutionary War. Revolutionary War. Because I expected, like, I didn't expect his family in any capacity to, like, be notable, I guess, in the rest of the story, if you get what I'm saying. No, like, if you ever go to Vermont today, you're going to see more monuments dedicated to people like uh, Remember Baker and Seth Warner than you will to Ethan Allen. Because they were the ones who were leading the Green Mountain Boys all through the revolutionary war. And they were the ones who were present when, Oh fuck. I shouldn't spoil that. We'll, we'll get to it. Spoilers much Derek. No, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not going to spoil that. I'll just keep going on. Um, and when they discovered his body, the Mohawk warriors beheaded him and they took his head to Fort St. John where they displayed it on the end of a pike. Oh Jesus. He did not have a good death. Oh yeah. No, it was really bad. God, I feel bad for remember Baker. Yeah, it was it was not great. Um, the British fort commander, of course, thought that that was crazy disrespectful. No shit. So he had the head taken down and it was it was given a Christian burial in the fort. Remember, Baker was the first American casualty of the invasion of Canada. Damn, that sucks. So let's let's take let's yeah, let, let's take stock real quick. Ethan's Ethan's just had a mind-boggling rise to fame and sudden fall he had his feelings betrayed by his own neighbors at the grants 
his best friend in the entire world has just been killed and his body mutilated. And now, on top of all of that, the invasion of Canada is going very slowly because Philip Schroiler, let's I'm not going to I'm not going to mince words here. Philip Schroiler was an idiot. He was not a smart man. He was not a good commander. I would have never guessed, Derek. And this invasion of Canada was going at a snail's pace and he was wasting the summer, the summer heat, and pretty soon the snow would be there and the campaign would be ruined. All of this created a combination that made Ethan sort of lose his mind. No shit. Can you blame the man? I cannot. No, it, he's his life's pretty fucked up at the moment. <laughs> um, spoiler alert. It actually gets worse. Oh, fuck. Yeah. So around that time, due to health issues, General Schroeder actually steps down from his command and hands it over to another guy named General Richard Montgomery. Montgomery sent Ethan out. I'm guessing Montgomery doesn't utilize Ethan any better than Schroeder did. He actually does a lot better. Well, he's, he's using Ethan for the same thing, so not I guess not better. He doesn't get command, but um, he is sending Ethan out on these scouting expeditions with like 80 guys. So they get in like a few skirmishes with redcoats and militia and they win a few like feel like small victories and they start. This is when he's recruiting uh, Canadians like crazy. He's just getting hundreds of guys on board with fighting for the Continental Army. It's it's insane. So he goes sicko mode. He's going sicko mode. Yeah. Uh, he goes out on the scouting expedition with another officer named Major John Brown. As far as I know, no relation to the other John Brown. That would have been hilarious if there was a relation. Yeah, it, I mean, they're both from, I think, I think Major John Brown is from New Hampshire. And, oh, where was the other John Brown from? He was, I think he was from Connecticut. But he was from New England, too, so there might be. Where was, remind me where the actual famous John Brown was relevant in history. I can't place my finger on it. Um, he was the abolitionist who fought in Be- Bleeding Kansas and attempted to lead a raid on the Federal Armory at Harper's Ferry so he could arm slaves and lead a slave uprising. Yes, I remember that. I remember that now. I just, for the life of me, at that moment, I couldn't. Yeah. And I know he's from New England and all of the New England states are kind of culturally and uh, population wise kind of interconnected. So I guess there's a potential that they're related. So but I'm really not. I I don't know for sure. There's no confirmation, but headcanon confirmed. Yeah, headcanon confirmed, which this this John Brown is a lot less cool than the other John Brown just because he, he doesn't do anything. Oh, man. He doesn't do anything, and that actually turns out to be a problem. Uh, <laughs> you'll get that in a second. Uh oh. So yeah, they go on the scouting expedition. Their mission is to recruit a bunch of French Canadians to join the American invasion. Ethan decided that that was not enough, and unofficially expanded his mission a little bit. Within a few days, they had recruited over two hundred French Canadians. That doesn't surprise me in the least. That Ethan Allen expanded his mission yeah he he started out this story expanding his mission from uh not being involved in the american revolution to capturing fort ticonderoga so it expanding the mission a bit is like his forte at this point agreed like a hundred percent within a few days they had recruited over 200 french canadians with a force like that ethan and major brown got it into their heads that they might be able to deal a big blow to the british They wanted to capture Montreal by themselves, the city of Montreal, which at this time had about like, I think it had like 25, 30,000 people. And it was a fortified city situated on an island in the middle of the river. And they were going to take two, 300 some odd guys and capture it by themselves. That's their plan. How well did that go for them? Well, let's read on and find out. Do tell, Derek. Do tell. Their plan was to split their forces and assault the Redcoat defenses in two different areas. So they could kind of confuse the Redcoats, kind of like can't really kind of figure out like like where they're attacking from, how big they are, things like that. 
And then their plan was that when the attack commenced, that the members of the Quebec Committee of Correspondence, the sympathize, the Patriot sympathizers within the city, would rise, grab their muskets, rise up and join the fight and assault the Redcoat defenses from the rear. That was the linchpin of their plan. They were they were resting the success of the plan on that happening. They put the plan into practice on September 25th, 1775. Ethan led his detachment of 37 Americans and 60 French Canadians to the eastern tip of Montreal Island at a place called Longue Pont, where he would wait. I am nailing it with this French today, man. God damn. Honestly, I've been impressed that you haven't even like stumbled over it. Like there's no way I would come close to even guessing right unless I had like a French speaker right there in my ear, Derek. Like I would like second doubt myself as I'm saying it. Be like, ho ho ho. Like I, I would I wouldn't be able to guess. <laughs> Oh, baguette. I'm sorry for anyone who might be in France listening. <laughs> I'm not sorry. I know this guy on Twitter. His name is Pierre. Pierre, if you're listening to this, I hope you're offended. What are you going to do if you get a DM from Pierre? Um, well, he's he's fought in like three different wars around the world. He's kind of a badass, so I'd be kind of terrified. But so, yeah, he, he goes to a place called Lancapont where he would wait for Major Brown to signal the attack. There were two major problems with the attack, if you couldn't already tell. The first one's pretty obvious. Ethan, uh, the the Quebec Committee of Correspondence uh, never came out to assist in the attack because the, the Patriot sympathizers in the city, they weren't in the city at that time. There was nobody in the city who sympathized with the Patriots. The reason for that was because Governor Guy Carleton had outlawed the revolutionary sympathizers in the city at earlier that month, and they had all fled to the countryside. And so the linchpin of their plan was that these people in the city who sympathized with them would grab their muskets and come out and help them. But those people are not in the city. The, the second problem was that Major John Brown never showed up. Does that surprise me? Not really. It surprised me when I read it. He shows up out of nowhere and supposed to be, and supposed to be the good, like, you know, out of nowhere person in our story. It, it, they, I, I, I figure he would be set up beforehand. Like he would play a bigger role in American history if he actually managed to pull through. I hadn't mentioned him before, but... Like he and Ethan had been working with each other for a little while and like during this this phase of like the invasion. So they already had like a professional relationship going. And then um, if I remember correctly, I think Major Brown goes on to be like a pretty prominent commander at the Battle of Saratoga. So he, he does some stuff and like he, the history knows about him. I, I just haven't brought him up in the story. Because he wasn't relevant until now. Oh, okay. So, but yeah. John Brown doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things is what Derek is saying. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. John Brown's body does not, in fact, lie moldering in the grave. He's coming for us. So yeah, Ethan waited there for hours, waiting for Brown to sound the attack. And in the meantime, Governor Carlton was finding out that there was an invasion force at the walls of his city and he had plenty of time to raise a force of redcoats, local militia, and Mohawk allies in order to confront Ethan. As soon as the British troops began to fire on them, half of Ethan's force ran, leaving only around 50 men. Hold on. How long had he been working with this force? This wasn't his uh, Green Boys, Green Mountain Boys, I mean. There were a few Green Mountain Boys there. This was his new scouting. Yeah, this was like a scouting party. Um, there were a few Green Mountain boys there who had just come along with him because they didn't. I would have been hella disappointed if the Green Mountain boys had ran on him. <laughs> no, this the none of the Green Mountain boys ran. It was mostly like the uh, like some militia he picked up back with the main army, and mostly like Canadians that he'd picked up along the way. All mo- I think all of the Americans uh, stuck with him. That was the bulk of the forces. Okay. That 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 gives me a little bit more reassurance. A little. So so the 
these forces, they briefly exchanged fire, but soon even Ethan was running. Uh, but his he and his forces didn't run for long because they were, it was kind of like a running gun battle. Like they run a little bit, they turn around, they fire to get them, keep them off their backs and keep running. And pretty soon they got tired out and the British force ca- caught up with them and overran them. Ethan, along with around 30 American and Canadian troops, surrendered and were captured. Ethan was now a POW. Do you remember when you were kind of confused about how Ethan was super important at the beginning of the war and then uh, wasn't involved for most of the rest of it? I'm assuming this is why. This is why. He just became a prisoner, an American prisoner of war in the Revolutionary War, which... Do, do you know anything about uh, what happened to American POWs in the Revolutionary War? No, not really. I ass- I didn't assume we had POWs back then. I assumed they were... E- well, I guess not. I never thought of it that deeply, but I would assume there was POWs, but they were either ransomed relatively quickly or they were just, like, <laughs> just killed. Now, at this point, POWs are just kind of kept around. And there's there's like specific there's like a sh- like codes of honor like unofficial codes of honor about how you treat POWs and you treat uh, officers different from enlisted men and all the all the kind of like like fancy uh, chivalric leftovers from like the medieval period that people still believed in for some godforsaken reason but it but it, yeah it was a thing. Um, but we'll we'll get into it. We'll get we'll I'll explain a little a little bit more. Okay, do tell my wise sir. Let's zoom out for a second. As violence was breaking out in Massachusetts, Lexington at Lexington and Concord, uh, the Congress after Lexington and Concord, uh, Concord, the Congress had sent a document requesting a peace and a resolution to the conflict between the colonies and the crown explaining that the colonies had no intention of breaking with Britain and that the conflict would be ended through the repeal of the Intolerable Acts and the expansion of colonial representation in Parliament. This was, I, I think I explained it to you, as the Olive Branch Petition. It was the Continental Congress's last-ditch attempt to uh, resolve this conflict without bloodshed. Is that just now happening, or is this talking about what had happened it happened earlier this year. Okay. It it happened earlier this year, right after Lexington and Concord. King George the Third responded to this petition, which was called the Olive Branch Petition, with what was called the Proclamation of Rebellion, which declared that legally the colonies were in a state of rebellion, meaning that any leaders that were captured would be treated as and executed as rebels. If you rebelled against the crown, then legally you no longer had rights. That's how it worked. If they did, does that really surprise me? No. No, that, that's just that's just how it works. That, yeah, this proclamation had been published uh, three weeks before Ethan's capture, and it had not even reached the colonies yet. But what this means for Ethan was that he was going to be treated as a felon while he was in captivity which would be a pretty big shock to him since he was expecting to be treated like an officer with special privileges since that's what he was. Because at the time, the the unofficial, un, unwritten rules of, pris, of holding prisoners of war during wartime was that if you captured an officer, then you didn't, you didn't keep them in chains and you didn't keep them in a jail cell. Um, it's it was what was referred to as a parole of honor. So they would be allowed to live in like a house and live in a bed and and be and they'd be allowed to run like they give be given like a, a certain rate uh, perimeter that like a distance from a certain location that they would be able to travel. Usually it was about like 10 or 12 miles and it would it would be like the honor system like they, they just they'd say like, well, you're allowed to travel this far. We expect you to come back. And you want to know the crazy part? Because I know what you're about to say is like, that sounds like a sounds like an awful idea. They're just going to go run off, right? It, it does. But I'm assuming since this is the way it worked, they didn't? They didn't. No, because 
if you're an officer in a military in the 18th century, you were wedded to this idea of like chivalry and honor and like fetishizing like knightly, knightly gentlemanship. And so if you're a prisoner of war, then then you're not going to try to escape because that would be disrespectful to your captors. Even though knights in Arthurian lore is very back and forth on what was actually followed and what wasn't from what I've seen on Arthurian lore. Yeah, if and like like the code of chivalry isn't based on like Arthurian legend. It it predated Arthurian legend. I honestly didn't know that. I assumed that um Arthurian legends stuck around for a while and then someone made the code of chivalry based on it. No. Uh, the Code of Chivalry dates back to uh, sometime in the 11th century, maybe the 10th century. I honestly thought chivalry was much newer than that, to be perfectly honest. No, it's... Do you know roughly when Arthurian legends first first started popping up? Yes. The first instances of it in writing came around from in the writings of monk, of French monks in the 1200s. And it got really popular in the 1300s. So it predates it by about, about 100 years? Yeah, a, a century or two. Um, and it was, and the Arthurian legends were, were directly, like the way that they were, like that Arthur and the Knights, Knights of the Round Table, they, they were portrayed in Arthurian legend, was directly inspired by the popularization of chivalric law. So... I had it reversed. Basically, chivalry probably inspired the mythos of Arthur uh, because we don't have any concrete proof that Arthur even existed or any of the knights existed. Yeah, that that is a topic that I'd love to talk about, um, but it's kind of complicated, so I won't at the moment. But um... it is very complicated. I used to listen. I haven't listened to it recently, but I used to listen to a podcast called Myth and Legends and. And I've listened to a bunch of different podcasts that have touched it at least tangentially. It is it is so weird that the Arthurian legends have such detail and like the way they are without any real proof that Arthur ever even existed. Because like you can look and look and like almost none of it is provable. Like even though it's it's a lot like that um going back to uh, Alexander the Great, that shield thing where it, they just ramped up it, where it seems like it could never happen, but it's so concrete in the history books that it, you have no choice but to believe it. Yeah, and they, there's a lot of scholarship on um, on like the origins of Arthurian legend. And you can go back with both Arthurian legend and chivalric law. Like you can, you can trace back chivalric law to like the uh, like, uh, like the Carolingian, uh, Carolingian, like codes of conduct amongst the nobility, like back in, back in the ninth century, uh, like under, like established by like Charlemagne and what would eventually be in the Frankish Empire that would eventually become the Holy Roman Empire, and in our, but then like in Arthurian legend, uh, even though its first written sources are in. French monasteries in the 13th century, you can trace a lot of those legends back to Celtic Welsh legends that originated in as far back as like the the sixth, the fifth and sixth centuries, and uh, uh, like kind of like a a morphing and a retelling of old legends based on real historic figures, but that like got all mixed together and mushed together. Uh, to eventually become something that's kind of unrecognizable and has been heavily influenced by the cultural beliefs of passing generations. So, so Im- imagine, imagine. Oh yeah. The, I guarantee you the modern understanding that your average citizen, not your historically inclined citizen is completely different to whatever historical event that they may have been based on or like, legends they were based on at least because like it is completely changed from what it was originally at least in modern context yeah and imagine like uh imagine you have a story about like a real guy who did like a really impressive thing in your community and you tell that story to your kids and they and then they tell it kind of wrong to their kids and then they tell it kind of wrong to their kids and you do that for like a hundred generations 
and then a hundred generations down, somebody else from the outside hears that that morphed uh, telephone game story, and then decides to put it into a it decides to write it down as their own story, but then turn it into like a political lesson, like it like give it like a political or social commentary, and that's basically what Arthurian legend is. Because I don't know if a lot of people know this, but at the time that that, that the Arthurian legends as they were originally written were meant to be funny. They're meant to be comedic. What? Yeah. You're supposed to be comedic? I would have never guessed that. Yeah, and the reason was because it was riffing, because it was presenting like knights and kings as these like these noble and virtuous individuals who have bear the blessings of God and as they go into uh as they influence the world around them when they're writing at a time when so you're saying i should view it, the arthurian mythos as a satire yeah like it i that that was kind of the original intent because of the time that they were being written especially in france it was a time when kings were starting to be it was kind of a time of like political centralization where kings were starting to become more powerful and were starting to take uh authority away from the nobles around them and as a result, a lot of nobil or a lot of aristocracy was starting to become a lot more decadent and a lot more separate from the church, uh, and more like, kind of like the stereotype we have of the decadent, uh, like nobility that we have today. And also at the same time, uh, like the Knights of the Round Table is funny because at the time that they were writing, knights were horrible people. They were nowhere close to like chivalric people. They were, they were basically like bandits going raping and pillaging just nonstop. And I mean, if you look closely at a lot of the Arthurian lore and if you sit down and actually like process what they were doing, that makes total sense. Like, yeah, they really didn't have a whole lot of virtue. Yeah. And that was, that was the whole point of of this or it, it's spec it's just one interpretation of it there's a lot of scholarship on it because we really have no idea what the writers intended for it or what the what specific little context individual context the individual writers because we really don't know the individual people who wrote them but um they uh but yeah like based on what we know of what was going on and like the cultural discourse of medieval year like western europe at the time it comes off as a parody or either a parody or like an envisioning of like a nostalgic looking back at what these institutions like the monarchy and knighthood used to be in their minds i think i hit my nail on the head it's a satire the, if like from what i remember of what i know on i 30 legends which is not a lot of academic research, but the podcast I listened to tried to give it its best modern take while staying true to what would actually have been meant at the time is outstanding, to be honest. Like, you, me looking back on what I remember, which I honestly isn't much from what I heard on them, it makes a whole lot more sense because, like, a lot of the Arthurian legends are actually pretty disjointed and they don't really make sense if you try and make one timeline as with a lot of myths to be perfectly honest yeah it's kind of like think about how like you got some shows that like each episode is uh is sequential so like a whole season is a whole story and then you've got other shows like sitcoms like friends or big bang theory that are like each episode is like its own that are episodic it's episodic. It's got each episode's its own plot line. That's how I kind of imagine uh, uh, Arthurian legend. It's it's episodic, which lends better. I feel like Arthurian legends are more um, anthological. Uh, so it's supposed to be set in the same universe, but the events don't really matter from story to story. I feel like it's more anthology than it is episodic episodic even though this the previous events don't really matter the they have sometimes they'll have an impact and 
the world uh, matters a little bit more on episodic. Yeah. Yeah, that makes yeah, that makes sense. And that e- either way, that format really lends itself really well to like uh, e- both like comedy and satire, uh, like from different perspectives and different angles reflecting different issues and also uh, to like moral judgments. Like if you're trying to portray different stories uh, portraying different moral judgments that have a, a bearing on like real life events. That okay, where do we leave off? Um, Olive Branch petition. So yeah. Um, so the way that it worked at the time was uh, officers would they they'd have like this this thing called parole of honor. They'd have uh, they'd be able to live in like a regular house and live like a re- relatively normal life. Uh, for a, what the time that they were in captivity, they just have like a specific amount of area that they were allowed to travel. And it, it was kind of the honor system that you wouldn't travel beyond that. And then eventually you'd have like a, uh, uh, a prisoner swap. So you'd, uh, you'd swap a certain number of prisoners uh, for a certain number of other pr- prisoners for the other side for Ed, it was a one-to-one ratio. So somebody who was a lieutenant colonel on one side is worth a lieutenant colonel from the other side. So it was equivalent exchange on hostages, basically, or POWs is the proper term, or else they wouldn't turn them loose. Right, yeah. And uh, for for ranks like below, like if he, if he can't line it up exactly correct, um, each rank below a certain uh, rank above it would be worth a certain amount of uh, soldiers from that from that rank. So like, uh, so like a sergeant or like a non commissioned officer would be worth like, like three or four privates. Um, a lieutenant would be worth a handful of sergeants or a whole bunch of privates. It's, it's something like that. And there's no set number. It was kind of up to the officers on each each side making an agreement to how many they were going to swap. So. I mean, that makes sense. Like, I assume that's honestly what happens. Uh, probably not as technical today when we're exchanging POWs, whether it's the U S or whatever you countries exchanging prisoners of war, but it, the openness is what baffles my mind to be perfectly honest. Them having that much freedom that they did is just, feels stupid but when you're following a code the way they were i guess it doesn't yeah and keep in mind that was just for officers like enlisted men like privates and non-commissioned officers would still like be locked up in prisons of some sort either like prisons or camps or whatever they had available so you're saying say commissioned officers were quote unquote the elite. So the elites always had special privileges is what you're saying since the beginning of the US. Yeah, and that's that's uh that's how it was in European warfare because all of the officers were from like noble families. And even though we didn't really ha- have like established nobility in the American colonies, uh it still kind of worked like if if you had money and you came from like a well respected family, then you could become an officer. And that's how it was in the U.S. military well after the Revolutionary War for a few decades until they started coming up with like uh, like West Point, like schools like West Point and Norwich and uh, the Citadel were big advancements in kind of democratizing the officer corps. So uh, your skill set and your ability to have like your demonstration of like actual leadership uh was more important to deciding officers um and it was a slow process like even by the civil war it was still kind of like you had to be rich to be an officer and that caused a bunch of problems on both sides of the war but by the time you get to like like the 20th century you start getting things like rotc and and that's when it it kind of is possible. It doesn't matter what your social class is. You can become an officer with as, as long as you have an education and 
uh, you've demonstrated like a leadership ability that's satisfactory to the military. But at the time, it was, if you're rich, you can lead a whole bunch of men to kill a whole bunch of other men. Again, that makes total sense given our, our history. So since Ethan was a commissioned officer, he expected to be treated with the special privileges due to an officer as when they were made a prisoner of war. But since his commission was through the Continental Congress and the Congress was now legally declared a rebellion, he wouldn't be subject to the regular laws of war. It meant that the only two things that Ethan now had to look forward to were a long trip overseas by boat to England and a short trip down by rope from the gallows. That's that's Ethan's future at this moment. Doesn't really surprise me, to be honest. I didn't figure his ending was very happy. Yeah. Um, so Ethan and his men were imprisoned on a British ship called the Gatsby. Their conditions on the ship were horrific. They were kept below decks in the hold where it was pitch black all the time. He was kept shackled to a 40 pound iron bar that held him down by his ankles. He had no bedding and just slept on the bare floor where he was constantly harassed by rats. Their food consisted of stale bread, rotting pork, and a cup of water a day. And for a toilet, they had a single bucket that they shared between all of them. How many people shared the bucket? Uh, I think it's all of them still together. So I think this is around 50. Wait, oh. It's around 30. Were they allowed to throw it away, throw it out themselves, or did they have to like wait till one of their guards came and got it? They couldn't throw it out themselves because they were la- they were tied down to these uh, irons. They were... So they just had to sit there with probably a lot of times the bucket overfilled and just deal with it. Gross. Yeah, and the, the bucket overfilled really fast because of their diet because of what it was they were eating, they were constantly shitting. And so it overflowed really quickly and they almost never, it almost never got emptied. The only way they could empty it was just by passing it down to the end of the line and letting the guy at the very end, like throw it off to the side where, wherever they had room. That's disgusting. Yeah. Aboard the ship, he was treated as a sideshow. A bunch of loyalists, including a bunch from New York, would come aboard the ship in order to see him in chains and mock him to his face. And they'd end up getting a rise out of him. And then they'd laugh as he cursed and struggled against his restraints. It was from that experience, seeing all of these New Yorkers and other loyalists coming to personally insult him and laugh in his face, that he developed a deep personal hatred for loyalism and for loyal for people Americans who stayed loyal to the crown. And he would carry that hatred with him for the rest of his life. That's foreshadowing. <laughs> yeah, that keep that in mind cuz that's foreshadowing. Foreshadowing is in he would hunt down loyalists or foreshadowing is he doesn't have a long life. Let's see. Uh, So, yeah, these guys remain chained up for a couple months in the ship, just sitting there in the St. Lawrence River. Uh, They weren't going anywhere at the moment. And then in early November, the American force had captured Fort St. John and were approaching Montreal. As the sounds of muskets and cannon fire echoed over the water, Ethan and the other prisoners were transferred to another ship called the Adamant where the conditions were just the same. The ship set sail on November 11th, 1775, down the river to the Hudson Bay, and then off on its way to England. As it sailed, it passed by the second prong of the American invasion that had just come up from Massachusetts by way of Maine and was currently camped on the banks of the river. That American force was being led by the now-promoted Colonel benedict arnold of the continental army wait i thought he was already gone from the continental army no when i was explaining his story before that was over the course of the entire war okay so okay that makes more sense continue 
yeah no at this at this moment he is leading part of the invasion of quebec as on this ship as he passed this american army camping on the banks of the river he probably passed within about 20 yards of where ethan or where uh, benedict arnold was how much do you want to bet that benedict arnold would have loved to at that moment shot ethan allen Knowing the kind of guy Benedict Arnold was, his first priority would have been to free him. And then his second priority would have been to shoot him once he was free. I don't know. Arnold Arnold kind of strikes me as a guy who challenged him to a duel. I think he, he seems like a dueling kind of guy. I don't know if he did any duels in his life, but I could. Oh, man. Imagine how his how great this story would be if there had been a duel between Ethan and Benedict. Just imagine this alternate history. Benedict Arnold frees Ethan Allen, and as soon as the fight's over, he's like, I challenge you to a duel, and one of them leaves. But yeah, neither neither one of these men would ever know how close they were to each other on that day. Some historians researching like what was going on in both of their lives at the same time realized that they were at the same place at the same time. But Ethan arrived in England in late December 1775, just a few days before Christmas. To his surprise, now this is where things get interesting. He arrived to an oddly friendly reception from the people in Cornwall, which is where they landed. As it turns out, Ethan had become something of a folk hero to the common people in England, who were themselves facing increasing poverty and wealth inequality as a result of Parliament's ever-increasing taxes. And while the people were happy to have a bona fide hero in their midst, the parliament was finding that suddenly having the hero of Ticonderoga on their shores was a very big problem. Was Ethan Allen causing issues or was the people who were sympathizers causing the issue? He was causing issues by being there and uh, encouraging the people who supported him. Like just him being there was encouraging people to speak out and question the parliament. Does that surprise me? No, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, he's he's a very, very potent figure. Just just by like being in a place, he's he inspires a lot of feelings and ideas in people. And at this moment, the the common people in England see him as the man fight the man who's fighting back against everything that is against all of the systems and institutions that are holding them down too. Can you really blame him to be perfectly honest? It seems like Ethan Allen like really stepped up in the colonies, at least to the people who were sympathizers and did something. Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly, it's exactly it. He's, he's living the fantasy. So besides Besides the fact that executing him like they were planning to might actually cause rebellious ideas amongst their own country's poor, they were also worried about the treatment of their own POWs that were being held by the Americans. Uh, So quick question. How did we treat POWs at the time? Were we? I was getting to that. The Continental Congress had received word of Ethan's captivity and the awful conditions that he was being held in. And by this this point, the Continental Army had taken 2,000 British prisoners of war. And Ethan's treatment had become the focal point of a larger debate over the treatment of POWs. Washington, for his part, went into the war with full intention of treating captured soldiers with full dignities according to the established laws of war. But this first campaign had made it clear that the British had no intention of extending the same courtesy. So I'm guessing Washington went, fuck you. If you're not going to stand the courtesy, I'm not either. Well, he, yeah, kind of, but they really, they really didn't want to because they just didn't have any sort of desire to mete out uh, punishment on captured British prisoners of war because they still had like a genuine respect for them. Um, But so Congress decided to that they needed to put pressure on Parliament. They needed to find some way to ensure that American prisoners of war 
were being treated fairly while they were in captivity by the British. And they thought that the only way to do that was to, for, they tried to do it in a system of like one to one. So for every one soldier that was being mistreated by the British, they would mistreat one British soldier in their captivity in the same way. Yes, but you're not going to know every time one of your people is mistreated, to be perfectly honest. Right. Yeah. And so it it ended up being a matter of like sometimes the the idea of punishment wasn't inflicted on POWs held by the Americans. It, it In some cases, it just didn't happen at all. And then in some cases, it turned into like a collective punishment where they just do like a blank, a particular like camp that was holding prisoners of war would just go full hog punishing everybody uh, and, and just, just overload on it. Uh, and, and so that was, they actually started this policy on uh, the, it was the British commander of Fort St. John. When Fort St. John fell, uh, his name was General Richard Prescott. He surrendered to the Continental Army, and he was the first British general taken prisoner by American forces. And so they decided that they would use General Prescott as the an example of, of this policy and publicly like blasted everywhere so that the parliament found out about it. Uh, they started off by uh, ref- by refusing to put General Prescott uh, on parole with honor and instead holding him in a cell with his ankles and irons just like Ethan Allen had. And so that's how it started. And throughout the war, you're going to see like a big there was a lot of variety in the way that prisoners were treated in the Continental Army. If Washington was nearby and it was and prisoners were under his direct control, they were very careful and gentle with British POWs. But if it was like some volunteer regiments like on the periphery who were uh, just involved in like small skirmishes or patrols and they happen to take like a prisoner of war, a lot of times it would just be fair game that a lot a lot of those cases, it was just torture. And even, even though it was an official continental Congress policy, um, reprisal punishments would be understood in a way that included like torture and like summary executions and things like that. And so, and so the wild thing is it actually kind of worked this policy of one for one reprisals. Honestly, this reprisal system sounds dumb as fuck. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, it was it was done because there's no real way to put it into practice effectively or in, or in an equitable way as they're trying to envision it. But the threat of it happening, and especially this situation, anything that they do to Ethan Allen is then going to happen to Richard Prescott, which not just an officer of his majesty's army, but a general. So if they tortured Ethan then the Americans would torture Prescott. If they killed Ethan, then they would kill Prescott. And they cannot allow that to happen. They, it's a cultural thing. They cannot allow a member of the aristocracy to die in that way or to be mistreated in that way. In any way, it is unconscionable for them to allow that to happen. And so that was one of the major motivating factors. The parliament was holding a hot potato by having Ethan Allen there because they couldn't just let him go because he was declared legally. He was a rebel who needed to face consequences for being a rebel, but they also couldn't execute him because then the same thing's going to start happening to their own POWs. Rock in a hard place. Yeah. They're in a pickle and this pickle is going, is saving Alan's life for now, at least. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Up until the very end, uh, Ethan has no idea whether or not he's actually going to be executed, but let's continue. Ethan was held at a castle at the town of Falmouth called uh, Pendennis Castle. While he was there, his condition somewhat improved. He had a bed. He had two meals a day. Um, sometimes his 
his captors would give him wine with his dinner and he was given ink and paper so that he could write. He was still like in a cell and he was still in a cell with all of the other prisoners, but he wasn't in danger of dying of some, some weird mut- mutant disease that you get from the most unhygienic conditions possible. So you're saying he was at least given enough good conditions where he wasn't going to die of disease, but he wasn't really living posh. Yeah. Yeah. He definitely wasn't comfortable, but he wasn't in danger. And he was also given ink and paper so he could write. So he started writing uh, letters back to the Continental Congress and back to people in, uh, he wrote a letter to parliament. I don't, it didn't really go anywhere, but he, he wrote a bunch of letters. That's how he passed the time. During the day, he was allowed to wander the courtyard of the fortress for like, it was like for an hour out of the day. And while he was out, locals would come up to the fence and just chat, chat with him. Uh, they'd ask him about his ventures, adventures as a frontiersman and the exciting life of the rugged New Englander, things like that. So he was kind of famous th- over there, wasn't he? Oh, he was the most famous person in in England at that point. The, he, he was all that anybody was talking about in England. I mean, he was the guy who captured Ticonderoga. It, in the French and Indian War, when the British captured Ticonderoga, they blew through like a thousand troops trying to capture that thing. It was really a really big deal. And it was a symbol of, of pride for the the system of the British Empire and for the Empire's ruling class. And he just gone and spat spat in their face by capturing it with 80 guys and getting drunk. So yeah, he's if you even if you don't like him, you're impressed by him. If nothing else. I mean he has some very impressive moments. Yeah, so that that was pretty much his life for a while. He wasn't comfortable, but he at least he wasn't in danger. Um that didn't it didn't last long though. There were liberal members of the Whig Party in Parliament who were like the more Republican constitutional party at the time. Uh, And they supported the Patriot cause. And they had managed to get what was called, it was a a writ of habeas corpus approved. I know what a writ of habeas corpus is. It's asking for relief from whatever your sentence is, is the dumbed down version, obviously. Yeah, and in the in this particular legal context, all it would mean would was that he would no longer be classif- legally classified as a rebel and he'd be given a fair trial. That's kind of mild to be even called a writ of habeas corpus. Writ of habeas corpus usually means hey, whatever um sentenced punishment I have, I want you to relook at it like um yeah, and that's it 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 if it, it was a flimsy and precarious sort of political maneuver basically. It it didn't have much legal precedent backing it up. It wasn't like legally solid, but it was had it been used before at this time or was this the early days of writ of habeas corpus? The the legal concept of habeas corpus had existed in British law for several centuries by this point. Um and I you probably know you're a you're a criminal justice guy. You 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 know more about habeas corpus than I do. I know that. But. I already simplified it as much as I can. Hey, I feel like my punishment is incorrect. You petition to the judges, and they will either hold off your punishment to relook at the case. They will decide. Hey, no, you were overcharged. And we remand it to the lower courts to retry it or they'll be like, oh, no, fuck off. Yeah. So I'm I'm not sure exactly what the complicated like legal maneuvers they're actually trying to accomplish here. But the long and short of it is they have this document which is going to theoretically entitle Ethan to an actual trial as opposed to just summary execution. The Secretary of State of the British Colonies, a guy named George Germain, the first Viscount of Sackville, he, that that such a I I listed that out not just because uh, I don't like the name and I ha- I hate the name, but also because I read a little bit about this guy, 
uh, just irredeemable piece of shit. When talking here, historical figures, how many people that are quote unquote on the bad side aren't irredeemable pieces of shit? Yeah, that's kind of the standard is like bad guys or good guys, if those distinctions mean anything when you're talking about history. But bad guys are good guys. Most of the people involved are probably going to be assholes. So, but this guy is not, he's, I don't like him, not just because he's especially like, not just because he's like a high tier asshole for the entire war, but also because he's just a slimy garbage human being. Yeah. He's just a, like in, even in his personal life, he's just a slimy wretch of a human being. He, um, he got the title Viscount Sackville, uh, from his, from his aunt who had died. He wasn't originally a Viscount. He was a, he was a more minor noble, but he inherited the title from his aunt who he had kind of forced her to leave him in the will. And the reason he wanted to do that was because he wanted to be referred to as the, the Viscount Sackville instead of his birth name, which was Germain because the name Germain was now associated with his, his career in the British army, which was a long string of, just awful like explicit cowardice and he he was so explicitly bad to the troops that he led that he was forced to leave the army like he was he was a coward he was a bad leader he completely mistreated all of the men under his command and he was he was one of it was almost impossible to force out a nobleman and an officer from the british military because of the political repercussions but he was so hated by everybody in england that nobody came out and spoke on his behalf and defended him when he was kicked out of the army i'm honestly from what you've told me doesn't surprise me he sounded like a pompous asshole who was just trying to be a bigger pompous asshole yeah i explain all of this because then you're going to understand the kind of person who does what he's about to do to ethan i'm guessing he tortures or does something stupidly ridiculous to ethan stupidly ridiculous is a good way of describing it so ethan's about to get his writ and he's about to get his fair trial, like is his right as an Englishman and uh, a, like by their standards, a servant of the crown that instead of letting him have the trial, he rushes him onto a ship and gets him out of England. So he stays a prisoner. So what you're saying is he couldn't accept that Ethan Allen would be treated fairly so he had to run off with him to treat him poorly even more yeah there were two reasons why he did this the first reason was because there was a genuine concern that if they did have a trial which back then trials were very very open public they're almost like concerts like people would come out just to have fun and watch a trial happen and they were afraid that if they let Ethan speak on his own behalf at a trial, that he'd incite a rebellion in England. The second thing was, uh, Germain was, um, at this point becoming increasingly unpopular in his position, not just by, not just in like the political body, like the political, uh, community that already hated him, but also by the King who had appointed him to his position because he was the secretary of state of the colonies and the colonies were in an open state of revolt. And so it was obvious he wasn't doing a good job. No shit. And so he was, so he was just, he was getting back at Ethan is basically what part of this was. You know, like, like, like rebel, you're rebel scum. You're ruining my career. You're not getting your rights back that easy. I'm, I mean, from what you've described of this man, that sounds right on brand. Not going to lie. Yeah. Um, Ethan and the other prisoners prisoners are rushed onto a 
a ship on January 8th, 1776, hoping that, like I, like I said, having him back in America would prevent him from being a bad influence on the people of England. That ship, the Sola Bay, was part of a larger invasion force that was at that time heading for the Carolinas for a planned assault on the city of Charleston. This time, though, interestingly enough, the trip wasn't so bad. He and the other prisoners were allowed to roam around the ship. And they were given meals. They weren't good. They weren't. It wasn't enough to eat, but at least the stuff they were being given was edible. And during the trip, Ethan entertained himself by constantly trying to piss off the captain and challenge his authority. And and also for the first time in like, I think it's four months at this point, January. Yeah, four months at this point, he finally gets the chance to take a bath and shave himself. I bet you that felt amazing for him. Yeah. Keep, keep in mind, all of these prisoners, Ethan included, are all still wearing the same clothes that they were captured in back in September. That honestly doesn't surprise me. Not just through the trip across the ocean and imprisoned in a cell in a castle, but through all of the, uh, you know, the awful shits that they had. So let, let, let that marinate in your mind for a little bit. Um, so they set off back to America uh, for now. Uh, for now, it, it, though, though he wasn't out of the clear yet, for now, it seemed like Ethan Allen had escaped death. The ship first stopped in Cork, a city in southern on the southern end of Ireland. Uh, There are some Irish merchants who really hated the English, gifted Ethan and his fellow prisoners with wine, liquor, chocolate, fresh meats, a bunch of clothes or a bunch of cloth that could be made into new clothes Uh, with wine and liquor. Let's go ahead and take a sip. Uh, When the captain found out about all these gifts, he confiscated everything except for the cloth. I'm kind of surprised he didn't confiscate everything. Not going to lie. Yeah, I don't. I don't know why he let them keep the cloth, but he uh, maybe he was hoping they would make new clothes because I'm honestly think it was pity because he probably thought how no, I don't mean like nor like, oh, I pity the like pity is like, oh, your clothes look horrible. Cover yourself with something a little bit better, even if it wasn't great. Just specifically on the clothing is what I was getting at. Uh, I think it was more a matter of like your clothes smell like shit and I don't want to smell it anymore. Make get yourself some new clothes and stop stop being a stop smelling like a prisoner on my prison ship. So yeah, the ship actually had a tailor and so he actually went to this tailor. Was that common? Um on it this was like a frigate, so it was a fairly large ship. Um so it it was it wasn't uncommon uh for a ship of that size at the time uh cuz like you usually had like officers on board ships like this and officers were expected to wear like their their nice dress uniforms and keep them well tailored and so it was always good for them to have a tailor on board i guess it makes sense but it's still kind of baffling to think a ship would have a tailor yeah it's the british man They're and the same people who put tea sets in their tanks. Yeah, Ethan went to the ship's tailor and he had all this cloth he got made into a new suit. And so now he was walking around the deck of the ship in like this really nice, fancy tailored. It was like a like a sky blue fabric. And he had a tricorn hat made with like gold trimming. And he, he looked he looked he looked snazzy. How much cloth did they get? a bunch he they got a bunch of cloth yeah because these so was he the only one who got like a nice clothing or did everyone get new clothing i think the other ones got clothing as well um i don't think they bothered to make theirs as nice but they i'm pretty sure well he was the highest status prisoner right like yeah he was like the he was the commander so that makes more sense like like i said the British didn't recognize his status. That's why he was still being held prisoner like this. They were going to. They were they were going to give him a proper trial, but then this guy, jackass ran off with him. And then this jackass ran off with him. Uh, but but the reason that Ethan got the fancy stuff was because uh, 
he was the one who was famous in Ireland. He knew, he was all the Irish merchants knew who he knew his name and they wanted to give him like the super fancy stuff. He was the well-known soldier is what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. So from there, with the exception of one of the Canadian prisoners dying on the way, that's a sip. With the exception of that, it was an uneventful journey. Um, after a brief detour to Bermuda for some inexplicable reason, I couldn't find why they went to Bermuda first. But they went to Bermuda first, and then they sailed to Cape Fear, North Carolina. They got there on May 3rd, 1776. So remember, they set off in January, and they were just now making it in in May. Even for back then, that's way too long a trip across the Atlantic. That, that, that trips across the Atlantic did not take that long. I assume uh, it was because of how rushed it was. Uh, it's. I think they had a whole bunch because it was part of a larger invasion force. I'm sure they had like some other shit to do, but um, but they arrived in North Carolina a week before exactly a week before the first anniversary of the capture of Fort Ticonderoga. And then there in, in North Carolina, he was transferred to another ship called the Mercury. And then he was sent North on the ship. Once again, he was slapped in irons. He was stri- restricted to the lower decks and he was given limited rations. They arrived in Halifax, Nova Scotia in mid June where he was thrown into a jail He remained there for 10 weeks, suffering from malnutrition, scurvy, and at one point he had typhus. To be honest, that doesn't surprise me. It sounded like they treated him like shit and he's lucky to have survived the trip. Oh, yeah, he was he was being treated awful. He was this, this the people who were doing this to him, if they were alive today doing this, would be tried at The Hague. That's the kind of stuff he's going through, like war criminal level stuff. War crimes before we established war crimes. Around that time, George Washington had begun sending letters out expressing concern for Ethan's treatment and trying to organize a prisoner swap. Um, But it was going slow because the only person in the British chain of command with the actual legal authority to make the exchange was Governor Guy Carleton. Because he because Ethan had been captured in his department and Carlton had no idea where Ethan was at that point because he had just been taken off and nobody had seen him since in October. He Ethan was once again on a prison ship this time headed for New York city, which had just been captured by the British. This ship was probably the best experience of his captivity. He was given full meals and the captain treated him respectfully. When he boarded the ship, the captain apparently shook Ethan's hand and told him that as long as he was on the ship, that he would be treated as a gentleman. And Ethan was so moved that he broke down in tears, just sobbing like a baby on the deck of this ship. Had he been considered a gentleman before? No. No. Everybody else he'd been interacting with treated him like a felon. No, no, no. I meant like even before he was captured, was he considered a gentleman? It, gentleman is like a like a generic term. Like it, like gen, gentleman doesn't isn't doesn't refer to like a specific thing. It's just he he was in his like both like in New England and in the New Hampshire grants, he was considered like high class by the standards of uh, New England society because he came from a family that was one of the original founders and had, uh, and he was like an extensive land speculator. So he, he was considered like high class, but, but he, he, but in this, in this case, it just in the context, he means gentleman as in like, I'm going to treat you well, not as, as in like, I'm going to treat you like you're high class or anything. It just means, okay. Means I'm I'm gonna treat you politely. It's, I'm not gonna be an asshole to you. While he was aboard the ship, he found out that the Continental Congress had ratified and signed the Declaration of Independence back in July. While America was becoming an independent nation, he was wallowing away in a prison in Halifax. 
The colonies were now the United States of, of America, but the first 13 states of the new nation did not include his home in the New Hampshire grants. He was let off at on he was let off in Manhattan on November 30th, 1776, where he witnessed the devastation of New York City that was left by the British occupation. A fire had caught during Washington's retreat from the city and had burned most of the city down. And now only 5,000 of the original inhabitants of the city remained in what had once been a comparative colonial metropolis of 25,000 people. Everywhere, both New York citizens and American prisoners of war lived in canvas tents with little or nothing to eat. In January 1777, he was sent to what would end up being his final imprisonment, which when he was transferred to Long Island, and he was placed on parole, finally. How did parole work back then? They told you, they gave you a specific town where you were allowed to live, and you were allowed to travel anywhere within the county that that town was in. But if you left it, you violated parole, and they would arrest you and put you back in prison. More lenient than I would have expected, but... yeah. At, yeah, at this point, the debate or the kind of Cold War over uh, pr- treatment of prisoners of war was kind of starting to pick up. And they, they had kind of gotten to the point where they were in a contest to see who could treat whose prisoners better. And for to be fair, Britain was losing really bad. But in some cases, they were starting to treat at least like recognize officer ranks and things like that. So that's what was happening here is they were finally recognizing his rank and uh, allowing him to be on parole. Which is, of course, uh, by the old traditions of war, the the right of uh, of an officer captured in, in war. He was assigned to live on the farm of a Dutch settler named Daniel Rappelje. I hope I'm pronouncing that. It's it's Dutch, but it's not a Dutch name that I've ever seen. It's R-A-P-E-L-J-E. I think it's pronounced Rappelje. It's closer than I could have ever gotten. A Dutch Dutch is similar enough to German that I can kind of kind of generally parse out how it's supposed to be pronounced, but it's still such a nonsense language. He's living with this Dutch settler now. He survived on a diet of oysters and porridge every day. Very, very gross. Yeah, it's, it's so gross. i imagining in July, his brother Levi Allen actually came to visit him. Levi was the first familiar face that he had seen in a year and a half. But the reunion turned out to not be a happy one. Since he had been gone, his oldest child, his son Joseph, had died from smallpox. Fuck. Yeah, his only son. Well, I don't know if we should take a sip yet. Hold on. We've got more coming. His brother, I don't know if we've mentioned this name yet, but if I haven't mentioned it yet, let's get ready for a shot. His brother, Zimri Allen? No, you had not mentioned the brother's name. All right, let's get this baby done. Oh, I shouldn't. I shouldn't be this excited. This is a really sad part of the story. Prost. Cheers. But yeah, his his brother Zimri Allen, who was his wife, Ethan's wife and kids had been living with Zimri while Ethan was off fighting and had been captured. Zimri had died of tuberculosis. Damn, that sucks. News of his son's death completely destroyed him. No. no. After everything he had endured, this finally broke him in a way that he would carry for the rest of his life. Can you blame the guy? The other prisoners said that in the weeks following the news, he would fluctuate rapidly in mood. Sometimes he would be quiet and somber, and others he would be energetic and talkative. He began to fall back into his reckless habits. By April of 1777, he was regularly breaking his parole conditions and going for long strolls all across Long Island. He especially spent a lot of time going into Manhattan, where he 
made a note of the horrific conditions in which American POWs were living. I, I talked about how, or I mentioned how awful the conditions were for POWs in British captivity during the war. New York City was the worst of it. They turned New York City into an open, like a concentration camp for American soldiers who had been captured. They, con- continental soldiers of all ranks were packed into churches and other big buildings like factories by the hundreds over the whole city. Up to a hundred or so prisoners died every single night from malnutrition or disease or exposure of some kind. Sip. Mass graves were being dug everywhere uh, where prisoners would unceremoniously just be tossed a dozen at a time. And what Ethan saw absolutely enraged him and began to speak out against it to anyone who would listen. Of course, by doing this, he let everybody know that he was violating his parole by leaving the town where he was assigned. It's a bit of a problem. On August 30th, 1777, he was rearrested and he was put in a crowded cell in the basement of the New York City Hall, which had been repurposed into a prison. There, he suffered starvation rations and regular week-long stints in solitary confinement for misbehavior. He would suffer under those conditions for nine months. Then, on May 3rd, 1778, 952 days since he was captured. He was brought up from his jail and put on a ship. This ship carried him to Elizabethtown, New Jersey, where he was exchanged for a British officer. His time as a POW was finally over. I legit thought they were still going to execute him. I thought they were going to be like, I don't care what the officials say he's getting executed. Like, with the way that guy basically shanghaied him i thought that's what was going to happen he was met at elizabethtown personally by washington's aide de camp a man you might have heard of before lieutenant colonel alexander hamilton i have yeah we we talked about him <laughs> just a little bit hamilton introduced himself welcomed him back to america congratulated him on surviving and Uh, told him what a big fan he was and all that good stuff. Ethan had been a prisoner of war for two and a half years. He was severely sick, weak, and had lost a third of his body weight. But now he was on his way to Valley Forge to report in to his commanding officer, General George Washington, and report for duty. Hamilton took him out to meet with Washington, where the Continental Army was encamped at Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, Washington was ecstatic to see Ethan alive and well, and Ethan was himself was thrilled to be receiving the personal commendation of a man who he had come to respect immensely. During his stay, he was given a brevet promotion to colonel, which a brevet promotion is, um, it's a temporary promotion. So it's like, it you're given you're given a promotion long enough to be given command for this period of time to do a, an operation, but it's not long-term. Right. So he's given a brevet promotion to Colonel, but the weird thing is he wasn't given an assignment. So he, Washington just basically just said, you're a Colonel now go home, rest and recover. That's basically what he said. And also there's probably a hint of like, you're kind of a maniac and you're hard to deal with. So we're going to keep you out of the army for now. (laughs) So though Ethan was eager to get back into the fight, he, he didn't have a command or an assignment and he realized that he was too weak to be helpful anyways. And he was eager to see his family and his home again. Natural, of course. So he set off and returned to his home in Bennington in what was now by this point the independent Vermont Republic. You know what? That kind of surprises me. I thought he would have a hand to play in Vermont becoming a state. That's the thing, is that he founded the movement that eventually coalesced into the Republic of Vermont government. 
he founded the Green Mountain Boys, who successfully defended the New Hampshire grains long enough to become the Republic of Vermont. And then now that he's back, he's going to start getting involved in a lot of the political decision making that's going to help establish Vermont into the state that it eventually becomes. But he never had direct interaction with the actual events that created the state that he's now considered the founder of, which is really, really interesting when you really think about it. So let's back up. Let's back up a little bit. And let's talk about what had been happening in the New Hampshire grants since he had been gone. It ended up going to shit. Uh, yeah, after his capture, the invasion of Quebec, which looked really helpful, hopeful at first, ended up going to shit due to a combination of poor discipline, a shortage of supplies, and the sudden arrival of British reinforcements, including German mercenaries from Brunswick. They were called Hessians. You probably know them better as Hessians. They were not actually from Hesse. They were from Brunswick. During that time, the political leadership of the Grants had been pushing for recognition and inclusion as the 14th state, but due to the Congress's fear over the state of war, yeah, due, due to the Congress's fear over the state of the war at that time, they didn't want to risk losing New York as part of the coalition, and so they kept putting off the discussion for statehood. So the Grant settlers decided that they needed to take matters into their own hands because at that time they were only getting nominal protection from the Continental Congress and they had no real representation in the Congress for themselves. On January 15th, 1777, a convention of representatives of each township met and formally declared independence from England. They named their new nation the Republic of New Connecticut. How lame can you get? <laughs> it was it was because of most of the settlers were born and raised in Connecticut and so there's a connection there but as it turns out there was already a proposed state in what's now western Pennsylvania that was trying to get recognition that was calling themselves New Connecticut and so they had to change their name Jesus Christ <laughs> There were two different groups of people who had the same idea for the same bad, shitty state name. Um, so, yeah, they decided to change the name six months later. Ethan's friend, Dr. Thomas Young, suggested a new name for them. What he did was he took the French words, which it it was originally like part of, or generally like part of the French settlement. There's a lot of French influence in, in the region. And so he took the French word vert, which means green, and mont, which means mountain. And he combined them to create Vermont, or in English, Vermont. So Vermont is literally just French for green mountain. You know, I should have figured this out sooner with them being called the Green Mountain Boys, but I didn't. Makes total sense, but I didn't. The name was adopted on June 2nd, and on July 4th, the one-year anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, the Vermont Republic drafted its constitution. It guaranteed universal male, male suffrage, required public schools to be maintained in every town. It adopted the Green Mountain Boys as its official military force, and it was the first constitution in North America to ban slavery, the very first one, which... That kind of surprises me uh, because I didn't think there would be a quote unquote first state to outright ban slavery. I thought there would be states that were against it, but not not banning it. And then I assumed the Emancipation Proclamation happened. I didn't assume there was any formal ban before Emancipation Proclamation. Oh, no. All of uh, all of the states north of Maryland outlawed had outlawed slavery by around the 1820s what just just within their states though it was illegal to own a slave in no i get that but like that feels like it's too early holy fuck was the south behind yeah um britain banned all slavery in all corners of the british empire in 1801 so what you're saying is the states rights 
is all bullshit to the nth degree on the Civil War. It, it, that's oh, that's a complicated discussion. Yeah, it's bullshit, but it's bullshit for a very complicated reason that I, I won't bother going into right now. But I would love to have this conversation. I will find a way to bring it into an episode at some point. But I am sure you will get a Civil War episode, even if it's not directly on the Civil War, Derek. Fuck it. Let's do a John Brown episode. We're coming for you, Southerners. I don't know why I'm saying that. I'm from Texas. What the fuck? <laughs> Oh, I hated the South. Like, I don't mean like geographically. I mean like the Confederacy is absolutely evil. I don't care if they were just following. Oh, I f- followed the propaganda or states rights bullshit. The South was evil. The Confederacy was evil. Yeah the uh, the the German com- the German immigrant community that my ancestors were part of in Texas were oppressed and murdered by Confederate troops during the Civil War because they were abolitionists. So fuck the Confederacy, fuck slavery, and fuck you for flying that shithole flag. Prost. Cheers. Even though that flag doesn't represent what everyone loves to say it does. Yeah, it really doesn't. Anyways, um, uh, their first governor, the first governor of Vermont, was a former captain in the Green Mountain Boys. He was re- well respected as a mediator between the radical and conservative factions of the movement. He was a man named Thomas Chittenden, who hasn't come up in the story yet, but is extremely important in the history of uh, in the history of the state of Vermont. This is the first time that he would be elected governor. How many times does he get elected governor? Total 19. What the fuck? He's elect he is reelected governor 18 times. How long were their terms back then? Oh, like 1 year I think. Either one year. That makes more sense. 19 reelections at anything more than a year is ridiculous. Yeah, he's he is he's definitely the most famous of the founders of Vermont um it, because he's I, I he's one of those names that's known like at, at least if you're familiar with like American political history you know you're more likely to know about Thomas Chittenden than you are about Ethan Allen but uh, yeah so this is the first time that he is elected to the governorship of Vermont the reinvigorated British Army under General John Burgoyne started a new campaign in 1777, and the Continental Army was defeated at the Battle of Ticonderoga on July 6, 1777, allowing the British to reoccupy Fort Ticonderoga. So they took it back. During the American retreat, Seth Warner was given the task of slowing down the British advance and giving the, giving the army enough time to react. Uh, to retreat intact. He commanded the Green Mountain Boys as well as a force of New Hampshire troops in a rear guard defense at the Battle of Hubbardton in the in the northern part of the New Hampshire grants. Even though they lost, the army was able to regroup around Bennington where Warner's forces dealt a decisive and devastating defeat against a detachment of British forces and forced them to retreat back north. This was called the Battle of Bennington. The Battle of Bennington held up the British long enough to allow the Americans to regroup, receive reinforcements, and confront Burgoyne's combined forces at the Battles of Saratoga, where they completely shattered the British army and accepted Burgoyne's surrender. The Green Mountain Boys fought at Saratoga, interestingly, under the command of now Brevet Major General Benedict Arnold. So Benedict Arnold finally got what he wanted and commanded the Green Mountain Boys. (laughs) A couple of years too late. And this is still before he betrays the U.S.? Yes. He has a lot of, like, history before he betrays us. Yeah, the majority of the war, he's on the American side, and he's kicking ass. He's really good at what he does. Uh, on his way back to Bennington, Ethan decided to stop by Salisbury to see his brother, Haman. When he arrived... Oh, my God. 
When he arrived, he found out Heyman had died of tuberculosis just a week before. <sighs> it's another sim. While he was withering away in a variety of different British prisons, he had lost two brothers and a son. Damn, that must have been hard on him. He's about to lose his mind again. What makes you think he had forgot it back? Uh, I mean, he was a very emotionally troubled man, and I I feel awful for him right now. He he arrived back in Bennington, having picked up his wife and kids on the way. This was the first time he had ever met his three his now three year old daughter, uh, Marianne. You're saying this man had a child he never met during this whole fucking time? Yeah, like just before he went out. The last time he had seen his wife was just before he went out to uh, to join the invasion force under Schoiler. And apparently they had gotten busy and she had a kid while he was gone and he ended up not being able to come back because he was captured. And so now... Marianne is three years old, and he's just meeting her for the first time. Do we know if he knew his wife was pregnant? I'm sure. I'm sure he found out from Levi. Uh, or I don't. I I'm sure he knew that she was pregnant. Or while he was out on campaign, I'm sure he got a letter from her or from uh, Zimbri. Um, but I, I can't be. I can't be sure though. Honestly, that's fair. Records on that probably aren't super great yeah it a lot of this information is coming from his own memoirs so it, and besides like the take it with a grain of salt stuff even like the accurate stuff like there is some stuff that he leaves out which is annoying but obviously you're not gonna think everything is important when you're doing your own memoir yeah that's that's why i can never journal whenever i try to journal i had every single little minute detail because i'm thinking in my mind what if somebody reads this in the future and they need to know something i only think of what would i need to remember in the future because like when i don't journal often honestly it's been before i graduated high school since i journaled last but when i did i was really writing down hey this thing happened this is how i was feeling because of it or hey this is today's date here's how i feel because i felt like writing down about it uh no sooner than he arrived and of course of course he arrived to basically like a party people people in the in vermont now now it's vermont he's entering actual vermont for the first time um and everybody is losing their minds celebrating. They're so excited that he's back. Um, as soon, no sooner than he arrived, he dove right back, right into the political scene of this new republic. And after everything that he had just endured, he was ready for blood. Let's get into this. We're about to see a reign of terror. He, he goes evil mode, basically. He... Yeah, we're we're about to see like a miniaturized version of like the guillotines in Paris in a here in about twenty years from this point. What the fuck? How? It 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 doesn't involve like actual. It, there's a few executions, but it may. I'll get into it. The new government of Vermont had started an internal campaign against loyalists. They were seizing property and they were driving any Tory influence they could beyond their borders, which involved a lot of exiles and, if they could prove any crimes, executions. Ethan was appointed as the prosecutor in the trial of a captured loyalist named David Redding, who was accused of spying for the British. Redding was found guilty and became the very first person executed in the state of Vermont. At this time, while the um, the bulk of the Green Mountain Boys were were enlist were on the uh, the muster for the Continental Army, and so they were in Warner's regiment, but there was they had built up a second, uh, like a militia wing of the Green Mountain Boys that were still back in Vermont, and were still defending the Vermont borders. Um, Ethan was commissioned to command the militia wing of the Green Mountain Boys. And he took them out to start raiding towns. 
that were known hotbeds for loyalists. How did what did raiding towns imply at this time? Like I understand raiding and like the rape and pillaging way, but what do you mean raiding in this context? Um, in this in this context, it was um, they would uh, they would go into a town and they would break into people's homes. And usually they'd kick them out of their homes and they'd steal all the stuff inside. It didn't involve like rape and murder, but a lot of vandalism and what they were now calling confiscations of property. How often did they actually get loyalists and how often did they get just random innocent people? Or do we even know? Uh, It was the, the Vermont was a tight knit enough community that everybody knew exactly who the loyalists were. So the, they weren't if I'm sure it happened like they ended up targeting somebody who was actually like loyal to or was was sympathetic or was part of the patriot cause but the vast majority of the time as and as far as the records can tell even like historical like re research into it uh everybody that they targeted were definitely loyalists And Ethan was like personally responsible for rooting out who were loyalists and who weren't. And he got really good at it. I kind of assumed there was like a knowledge base of guesstimating who was a loyalist, but I didn't realize they were like a tight knit community. Obviously Vermont was still kind of small compared to today, but still. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So they, they started with the town of Dorset. And this this is where we get into like some psychology stuff, because Dorset was the seat of the convention of the town elders that voted Seth Warren Seth Warner to command the Green Mountain Boys Regiment, and they did it at Kent's Tavern in Dorset. Some of the Green Mountain Boys and some eyewitnesses reported seeing Ethan personally vandalizing and looting kent's tavern and cursing and raging the entire time he was doing it so this this isn't just about the cause anymore this isn't just about defending defending the property of the settlers of the new hampshire grants this is now this is him blowing off rage in my opinion like at least from what little i know this is him lashing out just his own version of raping and pillaging, but he's trying to focus it sometimes. Yeah. It's, I can't imagine because he was trying, he's, he's, he has so much trauma, not just from, from living in captivity as a POW and all of those experiences, but then coming home and finding out like, like most of the people he loves most in the, in the world are now dead. And they died while he was gone because he went on a reckless attack on a city that he he should have known full well he couldn't take. And as a result, he was gone while the people that he loved died like that. That has to be what's going through his head right now. Oh, he's got to be super fucked up. He needs somebody to blame and he needs to take it out on somebody. And that and the Ver, the Republic of Vermont making him like the commissioner of of appropriation and the seizure of property from loyalists they have given him the opportunity to do exactly that and he is using it to create a reign of terror in the state that he founded it this is the this is the saddest not not just for the people of Vermont, but for him. This is the saddest moment. He's a broken man at this point, to be honest. Yeah, and it, it'd be bad enough if he was a broken man, but he's a broken man with power. And that is the most terrifying thing I can think of. And that that this this is a this what he did in Dorset is a pattern he repeated all over Vermont. He would go into a town, I identify the loyalists. And use the militia to drive them out of their homes and seize their property in the name of the Republic. Eventually, his confiscations hit closer to home. He discovered that his brother Levi 
the one the his brother who had visited him at Long Island when he was in captivity was secretly trading with the British. And in that moment, his hatred of loyalists trumped his sense of family loyalty. This man is broken even before this. And you expect him to make a rational decision on family after this? Well, if nothing else, at least we could say he's consistent and doesn't play favorites. But yeah, he he confiscated all of Levi's property in Vermont and forced him into exile from his state. And his brother was left completely destitute. I don't know what happened with their relationship. I don't know if they ever came to terms with what happened or if they ever reconciled or if they just never spoke to each other again. I couldn't figure out. I couldn't find find it. But outside the tumultuous borders of Vermont, things were changing in the war. The New York government, which to this point had been technically loyal to the crown, like like up to this point in the war, the actual acting government of New York was still proclaiming loyalty to the crown. Even though there was like an entire other government who was lo- who's loyal to the Continental Congress and who had been the ones actually in power. So at this point, the, the ones that were professing loyalty to the crown were more doing it in like an act of show because they didn't really have the power anymore or it it's complicated it's like they had the power they still had the power of law over the colony of new york like they they still controlled like the police and the local militias and things like that but that was all kind of trumped by the fact that the new york committee of correspondence uh had direct access to the Continental Congress who controlled the Continental Army who controlled all of the regiments of all the regiments from New York. And so you're saying the loyalist government still existed but it wasn't effective anymore. Yeah, it was it was moderately effective in domestic matters. They still had control and they were still kind of like cracking down on uh patriots in 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 parts of New York. Not in all parts, but in part, in some parts uh, up to this point. Uh, But they didn't, they couldn't make it, they couldn't extend widespread power because of the huge presence of Continental Army troops in New York, which they just, they couldn't do anything about because all of their men of fighting age were either in the British Army or in the Continental Army. And so they just they didn't have anything to work with. They couldn't express their power in any meaningful way. Whereas the the Committee of Correspondence could express their power directly through the Continental Congress, who controlled the Continental Army, who were in New York. So it, it's it's really complicated. It it goes into a lot of like how how the colonies were structured and uh, but regardless, um, the New York government. Uh, underwent kind of a soft coup so there that the previous governor um uh that guy tryon that we talked about uh he was kicked out and they elected a new governor a an officer in the continental army named george clinton who was loyal to the continental congress and so now new york's Gen- New York's government, their general assembly was now a revolutionary government, but it, this, this didn't improve things for Vermont because Clinton was still opposed to Vermont's recognition. Despite all of his radicalism, he still supported New York's claims to the lands that are now Vermont. His influence in the Congress was increasing and a recent controversy over several so what happened was there were several new New Hampshire towns that were on like the west side of the state that felt kind of abandoned and overlooked like in taxation policy and in funding for like militia forces and things like that. They felt overlooked by the New Hampshire government. And so they decided since New Vermont was right there, 
they're just going to go and defect to Vermont. They're going to secede from New Hampshire and join Vermont. And the Vermont government's going to have direct access and be able to assist them in the things that they need. So they voluntarily chose this, but it caused a huge controversy in New England because a lot of a lot of New Englanders saw this as Vermont um like going like going expansionist and trying to uh trying to gobble up the other states around them. And so that that caused this huge controversy which was alienating Vermont but especially Ethan Allen who was blamed for it putting them at odds with a lot of their new their allies in New England. Does that make sense? I feel like that was a lot of information. Kinda. So it's it's a lot of a lot of weird 17th 1700s politics going on. But so Vermont needed Vermont was losing influence in the Continental Congress that they needed to be building up in order to eventually get to the point where they could be recognized in statehood. Um, And soon an opportunity arose. Lieutenant Colonel Justice Sherwood, a former member of the Green Mountain Boys who had known Ethan Allen since childhood, was the commander of the Queen's Rangers, a unit made up of loyalist sharpshooters fighting for the British. He was also secretly a leader of the British spy network in Quebec and New England. In 1780, Ethan started secretly meeting with Sherwood to discuss the possibility of Vermont returning to Britain. Fucking loyalist. Are you confused yet? Are you confused? How, why is Ethan doing this? Why is he, Ethan hates loyalists. Ethan despises loyalists with every fiber of his being. He's he's wielding his rod with the wrath of God upon the state that he helped found because he hates loyalists so much. And now he's meeting with a loyalist spy discussing returning to Britain. I didn't think he doesn't think the war is going to win. That's my only guess. That or it's a double cross. It's to try and get intel for the Ar- Revolutionary Army. That's the only two guesses I could give. Yeah, Let's get a little bit more information real quick. It began with a secret ceasefire. The border between Vermont and Quebec would be sort of like a demilitarized zone of sorts. And the two sides would stop sending patrols. There was also discussion of a prisoner swap. Over several meetings, they began to discuss the possibility of Vermont leaving the Patriot cause and becoming an independent protectorate of Britain. These discussions went on for roughly two years, but eventually went nowhere because nothing was being done on either side to make these plans happen. And then when the war ended and the United States had won, the entire discussion became a moot point. So let's dig into this a little bit. What do you think Ethan was doing? This is so out of left field for him. My only guess is he was trying to gather intel and send it back to the Revolutionary Army. That is literally the only guess I have. Yeah, the the, the double play game. That's a That's a really good guess. It fits with his character. Here is my theory, because in reality, we really don't know what motivated Ethan to do this. What we do know is that he was having growing frustration at the Continental Congress for being wishy-washy and on the issue of Vermont statehood. And now at this point, it was becoming more and more clear that the delegates from New York were getting more influence in Congress against Vermont statehood than Vermont was getting for it. But there's something that we, we have to keep in mind that up to this point, he has never demonstrated a propensity for backstabbing or double crossing. That's just not in his character for all of his faults. He does really have a sense of honor and he does have a genuine loyalty to the cause of the United States. Let's look back for a second at the 
court case where it was decided and settled in Albany that the settlers of the New Hampshire grants were to be legally classified as squatters and eviction notice notices were to start being distributed. When he was presented with a bribe from James Duane and John Kempe, his reaction was to take the bribe and leave and then go back and never act on it. Uh, that's his um, take on this then. He's going to pretend like he's working for them, get whatever benefit he can and never act on it. Yep, there is. There is. Uh, it's almost like that. So what I think is going on is that there are certain positions that Vermont, Ethan wants Vermont to come out in a certain situation. He wants Vermont to be a state in the United States, but he also wants Vermont to be open for trade with Britain via Canada. How do you recognize, reconcile, my bad. How do you reconcile those two things? back then because i feel like did britain trade with us for at least a period of time after the civil war no it's not civil war the revolutionary war they yeah britain and the united states started trading almost in, as soon as the war ended what yeah because they they britain needed money from trade with the colonies and the colonies were not going to survive without goods from Britain. It was a colonial relationship, and that relationship didn't go away uh, just because they suddenly became independent. I would have thought that the recognizing of the independence of the U.S. would be begrudging, and that they would be like, well, no, we're not sending you shit. You get it from Spain, you get it from France, you get it from the other people, but Britain's not sending it to you. No, because Britain wants the money and the wealth that comes from trade with America. That was the whole point of having the American colonies in the first place was the, to monopolize that trade. They can't just say fuck you to the American colonies and refuse to trade with them because their economy would crash. They literally rely, they, they have developed a system where they rely on income from trade with within this colonial system. And even though America is politically independent, they cannot afford to give up that trade. I mean, it makes sense, but that's not kind of how the quote unquote American picture painted it for me. Like, yeah, because the American picture is dog shit. Like the, the way that they was taught at school is so f oversimplified and so unnuanced that it is, I'm not going to answer this. Anyways, go on. I'm sorry. Yes, very much so. We are not nuanced in our teaching of any American history. We like to think everything was like, yes, America was in the right, or like America pulled out, or this, that, and the other. And we did what was the optimal thing at the time, or whatever, to make us look good. But that's not how things went. Like, history is written by the victors. But that doesn't mean that's how things went down. So in the context of Vermont, what they want to accomplish is to ensure that they have a place at the table when America wins the war, which they are all ideologically obligated to believe. They have to believe that America wins the war. And they all genuinely do believe America will win and be independent. They believe that will happen and they want and out of pure personal interest this is just a matter of raw personal interest ethan believes that vermont must have a seat at the table of the united states but at the same time so much of the economy that has been built in vermont the fur trapping the timber logging it all of this trade has to go to britain they cannot give that up. I guess that makes sense. They, The obvious target of their trading and resources has to be Britain and not the colonies because they've been doing that this whole time. Obviously, the colonies are going to get saturated with their thing because the colonies were 
I wouldn't say super tight knit, but tight knit enough to where they've probably outsold what they can at the time. You know what I mean? And so the only natural next progression would be to go to Britain, even though Britain's not good with them right now. They need to make sure they have the open line of trade once the war is over. It's I. I'd say it more has to do with just the colonial relationship between a colony and the mother country. So the, the way that it, the economy of the, of the colonies that would become the United States, the way that they function in the colonial system is that they have an abundance of raw materials that they will send to the mother country, which is industrialized. The industrial mother country, in this case, Britain, will re will uh, use those raw materials in their manufacturing process to create new products, which they will then sell back to the colonies, which the colonies need because they don't have the capacity to develop them in their own country. So that and that is. That's kind of an oversimplification, but isn't that kind of how things are going with China right now with us? We send them a bunch of raw materials. They send us a bunch of dumb shit. Sometimes, sometimes really good shit, but like process stuff, basically. It kind of, but we've moved to a, it. It's complicated, but like in the modern day, we've moved to a system where our, our source of wealth isn't based on, uh, the source of wealth of our economy isn't based on just the productive force. It's based on interest and investment. It's been very much uh, financialized. Oh, no, definitely, definitely. I was just meaning the, our trade system, not like our form of wealth. Like we send China a bunch of raw materials. They send back completed materials nowadays. Well, even even then, like, the raw materials don't even come from us. It comes from other countries. We, we have the United States economy has uh, financial relations with one country that has raw materials that get then gets sent to another country like China to produce into consumer goods, which are then sent to our country. And it is all being managed by the financial sector of our country. And so it's like, it's like adding layers to a wedding cake of it, of colonialism that makes sense in like a as much sense as our financial system makes kind of way but that's i think there there's a sense of that happening here but it just a more general sense i think what's happening with ethan in talking to just justice sherwood is he knows full well that the well-being of Vermont is going to rely both on its political association with the United States and with its trade relations with Britain. And so it, he's trying to put them in a situation where Vermont can be in that, in that position. That is what I believe is happening. He's playing. And then, at, and then while he's doing that, uh, word is leaking out rumors are leaking out that now ethan allen and vermont are talking to britain about leaving the patriot cause and going to the side of britain that is going to motivate a lot of people in the content a lot of delegates in the continental congress to reconsider allowing vermont to re-enter the union because or allowing Vermont to enter the union in the first place, because not only are the green mountain boys, one of the most effective fighting forces in the continental army, but Vermont is a very tactically important and strategically important base of operations for any military force in the Northern colonies. So that, so he's, he's motivating both sides by by doing this, he is motivating both sides of the conflict to have better to be forced into having better relations with Vermont, which makes Vermont more valuable and by extension more powerful. That is what I think is happening here. 
And there's a lot of people who will say that it's just a naked, uh, it's just a naked portrayal and a power grab from a man who thinks that the Patriot cause is doomed. Um, and there's a lot of people who think, think that it was, um, the think that it was just outright a lie that the meetings with justice sure would never happened. But I think, I think the real reason has its roots both in his actual ideological beliefs in the cause of the revolution, having forcing to synthesize those with his fundamental understanding that the well-being of his, his own wealth, but also the well-being of the state of Vermont is reliant on coming out in a specific position. So that that's my case on it. I mean, I understand and uh, I kind of agree, I guess, as much as I can with not actually having done the research myself, but that's all I really have to say on the subject. Like it makes sense. That That's again, I'm just, I'm just an on and off college student who reads history books in my free time. So what the fuck do I know? Um, so yeah, it, regardless of the actual reason that Alan did the things that he did uh, in regards to, Justice Sherwood and the British Spy Network. Discussions ended right around October of 1781 because that is when the British Army at Yorktown, Virginia surrendered to a combined American and French force commanded by George Washington, signaling the end of the war and the victory of the new United States of America. Though Ethan, Ethan continued his writing campaign warning of the potential of the Congress's betrayal of Vermont, Life, life calmed down a little bit. He went back to writing philosophy, wrote his memoirs of the, of his time fighting for the Grants, his raid on Ticonderoga, and his time as a prisoner of the British. Just a few years after having their fifth child, a daughter named Pamela, Ethan's wife, Mary, died of tuberculosis. She was 50 years old. Over the course of their marriage, they had lived together, lived together for about half of the time that they were married. A year after her death, he married again. Wow, that's kind of fast. I mean, I guess modernly fast. Yeah, that it's it's pretty fast. It's pretty fast to get into another marriage just a year after your last wife of literal decades just died. But uh, might I... Um, might I bring up two points in Ethan's favor? One, she was really hot. And two, she was half his age. <laughs> oh, so he went with the young broad thing. Yeah. A year later, he married a woman named Frances Montressor. He was 45 and she was 24. Oh, damn. She also, and this is my favorite part. This is my favorite, favorite part. She also happened to be the stepdaughter of Creon Brush. I mentioned him in the last episode. He was the New York legislator who drafted the bloody acts. Oh, so this is also super kind of revenge. This is like, no, fuck you. I'm going to fuck your daughter. I, I'm i sure he didn't intend for it to be, but based on everything else, it sure seems like it. Uh, they would end up having three children together. A daughter named Frances Margaret Allen. How many did, How many kids did he have with his first wife, though? Five. One son, four daughters. And he has even more kids in the second marriage? Holy shit. Well, uh, in, his first, in his first marriage, his son died. In his second marriage, he would have three kids. First one was a daughter named Frances Margaret Allen, who was named after... Uh, Francis is uh her nickname is Fanny, his his new wife, her nickname is Fanny. Fanny's mom was named Frances Margaret, so named after her. Their second child was stillborn, and so he never got a quick question, quick question. Back in like revolutionary or prior times, was it common to wait till the birth to name your child? Yeah. Yeah, it was it was it was pretty common to wait for a while after your child was born to name him. 
Like I've heard stories about people who wait like six months after their child was born to give them a name. That's so vastly different compared to today because today we, we name kids before sometimes the pregnancy and viable and like there's a miscarriage or something and people will have extreme emotional distress because of it. Yeah. And it, the reason for, I think of, I think the reason for that is because nowadays it is virtually guaranteed that it's, if your child is born, then it's going to survive. Back then, that was a little bit more of a gamble. Understandably so. Yeah. Naming a kid before it's born, it, it was a little optimistic. But yeah, so their second son was stillborn. And his youngest child, and his last child, the last child he would have, and his only surviving son. Is oh, I'm gonna go ahead and pour the shot now. Let's, let's go ahead and get ready for this. Before you tell me what the name is, like on a scale of one to ten, how dumb is this name? Well, I'm a history nerd, so I think this name is rad as fuck. But I still think it's a weird name. It's a history name. It's a it's something that a history nerd would name their child. Okay, you got your shot ready. I have the shot ready. His youngest child and his only surviving son was named Hannibal Allen. Fuck you. That's not that weird of a name. I think it's weird. I guess because Hannibal Lecter, I don't think it's super weird. He named his son after the Carthaginian general Hannibal Barca, who fought against the Roman Empire in the Second Punic War. Oh, well. Cheers. Prost. He had... Four daughters from his first marriage who survived. He had one daughter and one son from his second marriage who survived. Uh, that that first daughter with his second wife, Frances Margaret Allen, uh, she was the one I told you about who would go on to uh, convert to Cath- yeah nun. Yeah, convert to Catholicism and became the very first nun ever born in America. All right, there's an economic depression in the years following the end of the war. And foreclosures became endemic. Honestly, that makes perfect sense that after a war, there's a economic depression. In 1786 and 1787, <sighs> oh, excuse me, Ethan publicly supported the exiled leaders of the Shays Rebellion in Massachusetts, many of whom had fled to Bennington, including their leader, Daniel Shays. That's a really interesting story, the Shays Rebellion. And it's the. It, I would like to do a story about Daniel Shays, and I want to make it part of a larger, uh, a larger series that we do on the history of the United States fucking over its veterans. Because that that is the story of Daniel Shays. It's a bunch of Revolutionary War veterans getting absolutely screwed over by uh, the people that they fought for. Does it surprise me that at the very beginning we were fucking over veterans? No. Nope. It's fucking over veterans as an American tradition. Even the founding fathers did it. <sighs> Later in 1787, a land dispute erupted between Pennsylvania and the settlers of the Wyoming Valley in what's now western Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvania legislature was claiming that the settlers didn't have clear titles to their land. And now they were threatening to declare them squatters and have them evicted. Again? Does that sound familiar? Does that sound familiar? As I said, again? The Wyoming Valley settlers called for Ethan Allen to provide aid. He publicly threatened to bring down a company of Green Mountain Boys to defend the settlers from eviction. That, combined with a couple friendly visits to the Wyoming Valley in person scared the Pennsylvania legislatures so bad that they recognized the settlers' claims and the situation was diffused. I'm honestly surprised it was that easy. It was that easy. He just had to show up and he scared the shit out of those landowners. Riots and uprisings like Shays' Rebellion and the Wyoming Valley Crisis convinced many of the founding fathers that the existing constitution, the Articles, which was the Articles of Confederation, that gave which it gave individual states a huge amount of autonomy and was too weak. It left the central government too weak and uh, too weak 
and it left the new the young country open to division and conflict they held a constitutional congress in 1787 and in 1789 they would ratify the constitution of the united states of america and the bill of rights which is still the ruling document of this country to this day so ethan had a hand in the constitution too was he one of the signers no no he was just so scary that he was so terrifying that he scared the founding fathers into making the federal government more powerful. <laughs> that sounds like him. He settled down to a simple farming life after that. There we go. On a cold February night in 1789, Ethan was crossing the frozen Lake Champlain to the South Hero Island to borrow some hay from his cousin. I don't know. I don't know if this is going to be a shot or not. This is going to be up to you. But his name was Ebenezer. I feel like because of Christmas Carol, that's not a weird name. You don't see it a whole lot. But because of Christmas Carol, I don't consider it a weird name. Okay, I'll I'll agree to that. Also, also, I'd like to mention this island he's going. I still say we sip for it though. Yeah, why not? Also. Um, I want to mention this island that he's going to, South Hero Island. Um, part of the hero, the heroes, which are an island chain in the in Lake Champlain. They weren't called the Hero Islands at the time. I can't remember what they were called. They were named Hero after the fact, or later on, uh, because they were named after. They were named in honor of Ethan. The Hero Islands are named after Ethan because he was a um, pre-revolutionary hero slash revolutionary hero. Yeah, yeah, like he he was a hero of Vermont, and so they named they named the islands Hero. Well, yeah, he's going to borrow. He's taking a he's crossing a frozen lake. He's taking a sled. He's going to borrow some hay from his cousin Ebenezer when he arrived on the island. He enjoyed a night of drunken partying and storytelling at the tavern well into the early hours. Do not take a sip yet. The next day, he and his farmhand, who is a freed slave named Newport, noticed that he was unusually quiet. Usually on these trips, he was very talkative and loved to just, just talk about whatever. He asked if Ethan was okay, and when he turned around and looked at Ethan, Ethan was just staring off into the horizon and he said the trees look unusually dark in the morning light after he said that he slumped over and collapsed newport carried him back to his farm by the time they got back ethan had slipped into a coma he had had a stroke the next day february 12th 1789 ethan's wife children his brother ira and ira's wife god Damn it, I forgot about this one. <sighs> I don't even feel good about this shot we're about to have because this is a sad moment. Ethan's wife, Ethan's children, his brother Ira, and Ira's wife, who is named Jerusha. Weird name? Not as weird as I was expecting. It's it's weird. Yeah, it's weird. I thought it was I thought it was one of the weirdest names in this story, but it, it... It sounds close enough to like a normal name to not be super weird, but I've n well, I would never come up with that name on my own. Cheers. Oh Lord. Whew. Okay. Now back to back to solemn. Okay. Ethan's wife, his children, his brother Ira, Ira's wife Jerusha, and all of his employed servants and farmhands all gather in a gathered around his bed. And they watched him draw his final breaths. <sighs> Is that a death that involves alcohol? Because he was drinking when he had the stroke. No. Because he had the stroke while he was drunk. But once he passed away, he was no longer drunk. If he had passed away shortly after having the stroke, yes, in my opinion. But if he, since there was so much time between the stroke and the death... I would argue no. Okay, I'll default to your judgment. 
that's just how my logical part while drunk says, to be perfectly honest. It's February 12th, 1789, and Ethan Allen is dead. He was 51 years old, and it was exactly one week after George Washington had been elected the first president of the United States. That is some shitty timing. That's like crazy timing. His funeral was attended by 10,000 Vermonters. Holy shit. That was 15% of the population of Vermont. Has that ever happened before? Where like a state hero gets that high of a population turnout? I don't know. Um, Maybe, I don't know how big Huey Long's uh, funeral was or how big his funeral was or i don't know alfalfa bill i bet he had a big funeral but but yeah it's 15 percent of the population of of the state vermont was admitted as the 14th state in the united states in 1791 two years after ethan died so it was the first addition to the colonies even though he died having never been a citizen of the United States. He served in the Revolutionary War. How was he not a citizen of the United States? Well, people serve in armies all the time without being a citizen of the nation it's an army of. Well, at least modern context, you expect to earn citizenship through their serving nowadays. He was never a resident of a state that was in the United States. He never voted in an election in a state in the United States, and he never had his name registered as for citizenship in any of the American states. So quick question. How did they treat people who moved from like, how did they treat people who came from like Vermont or say people who moved outside of the 13 colonies who moved back into the 13 colonies? Did you just gain citizenship or how did that work they mostly played it by ear it was it was not a very well organized process at the time uh basically they kind of just eyeballed you and if you looked like you were from around there then they're like okay yeah you're a citizen it was very much a case-by-case basis but ethan was ethan just was never he was never a citizen of the united states But despite that, that's crazy to think someone who played such an important part of our history, obviously he's not the most important, but he did play an important part in our history, was never technically a citizen of the U.S. Yeah, even the Marquis de Lafayette and Baron von Steuben were both citizens of the United States. But Ethan Allen, whose family had been in Massachusetts and Connecticut for like six generations was not a citizen of the U S that it, it, it's crazy. And it's just, it's just purely, it was just purely circumstance. Had he lived another couple of years when Vermont became a state, he would have been, he would have become a citizen. I mean, obviously he would have been a citizen if he had lived longer, but it's just crazy to think that technically he's not a citizen. But despite that, Ethan's belligerence and his constant struggle against all things considered sacred in colonial America helped form the nation into what it is today, for good or for ill. His writings and experiences influenced some of the most important, most prominent writers of the Revolutionary Period. The stories of his captivity still influences the American government's policy on prisoners of war to this day. How does it do that? Do you know or it because it he his his captivity as a POW was the very first like widely publicized pub, publicized uh story of a prisoner of war in a modern context. Like in modern warfare, like or at least the general meaning of modern as in like the, the last few hundred years. Uh, his was the very first one that was very widely publicized and the experiences and also the politics surrounding it very heavily influenced how 
uh, fed the federal government responds to not just not just having POWs themselves, but how they respond to governments who are holding their own uh, prisoners captive, just by the example and the mistakes and the shortcomings of all of the parties involved in his own experience, like uh, like the fact that when when Ethan Allen arrived in England, the political situation was so was was situated such that they couldn't do anything with him when he arrived. I guess that makes sense. And they like a lesson they draw from that is like, how do we avoid being in a position where we're politically vulnerable just by having a POW in our presence, stuff like that. And that, and his example still, the example of that is still a very useful tool for understanding how prisoner of war laws work in the modern context. I guess I would have never thought of it, but yes, you're right. There's a lot of things that throughout American history that even if you know you would have never thought connects, but does. The militia that he founded, the Green Mountain Boys, would remain the chief military force of the state of Vermont. They would be raised again to fight in the War of 1812, and then again during the Civil War, where they would see action at the Battle of Gettysburg. They'd be raised again to fight in the Spanish-American War. And to this day, they still exist, a direct descendant of the units created by Ethan Allen and his lieutenants in the form of the Vermont National Guard, who still bear the name the Green Mountain Boys. That's crazy. I would have assumed that there would be a lineage connected. I would have assumed there would be like a disruption or like a period of time where they didn't follow it. And then they were like, okay, we're still the period that didn't follow it, but we're starting to take more inspiration from the Green Mountain Boys. Yeah. Nope. The Green Mountain Boys always existed. They were always there. There was always armed and training as the regular militia force of the state of Vermont. They would be raised in times of war and they would be put back on reserve during times of peace. And eventually they were just incorporated into the National Guard system. So yeah, they still exist. And guess what? Now there's an there's a Vermont Air National Guard. So now the Green Mountain Boys have an Air Force. How fucking rad is that? That's kind of crazy, not a lie. <laughs> They've got the Green Mountain Boys still exist, and they have jet fighters. Honestly, that's redonkulous. I'm pretty much done now, but um, I'm going to leave this off with an excerpt from a poem that's called... The poem's called The Song of the Vermonters, which was written by a poet named John Greenleaf Whittier in 1833. And it was written about the about the New Hampshire grants and what would eventually become Vermont and specifically the Green Mountain Boys. And it represents like the, I think it represents well, like the proto-libertarian ideology of Vermont that was, that started with men like Ethan Allen and still influences the culture of the state to this day. Hurrah for Vermont, for the land that we till must have sons to defend her from valley and hill. Leave the harvest to rot on the fields where it grows and the reaping of wheat for the weeping of for the reaping of foes. Come York or come Hampshire, come traitors or knaves. If you rule our land, you shall rule our graves. Our vows recorded, our banner unfurled. In the name of Vermont, we defy all the world. And that is it. That is the story of Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys and the founding of the state of Vermont. Honestly, that's a deeper history than I expected from vermont um i didn't expect it to be that entwined entwined let me repeat myself with the revolutionary war um for some reason my preconceived notion was that during the revolutionary war it was only the 13 colonies and there were no outside forces quote unquote until the french got involved but technically outside forces or 
quote unquote future American forces, as in like the Vermont people, were involved. And I just, it's, it just makes you think of how woefully unprepared American history classes, at least in high school. I didn't take any extra other than like humanities credits history you're left with from um, at least our teaching when you're not a history major. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. It's, I really, I really like the sort of like biographical sort of narrative structure we've developed on this podcast, because I think that it, it helps us both analyze like the nitty gritty aspects of history that a lot of people don't really think about while also humanizing them through the eyes of people like Ethan Allen, who experienced all of these things and through the course of his life was interacting with all of the different forces that were driving history forward. And I I think that's an aspect. The more I think about it, the more we do this podcast, the more I think about it, uh, the way that, like public public education in the United States treats history as very simplified is the only word I can come from come up with is like it simplifies it to a point where it's laughably incorrect. Yeah, it's simplified, but it's the specific way that it's simplified. It's almost it's dehumanized and it's decoupled from like the experiences of the people who actually lived the things that we're discussing. And I, I I hope that by analyzing the lives of figures that we've covered so far, like uh, Ethan Allen, Frederick the Great, Alexander, that we've helped open up an understanding of these periods of history and the forces that caused these events and that still shape the way that we live uh, through through a human eye i hope i hope that we've we can present them through an eye that makes us empathize with the people who went through them and help us better connect with the the ways that they still affect us personally as well to this day it kind of shows how incomplete american history is because like the way i was taught and again, this is just probably poor memory, poor education from a sh- small school. But the American Revolution was a very tight timeline. Like, there wasn't a whole lot of extra stuff happening. It felt like a book narration, you know what I mean? Where there wasn't a whole lot outside of the main narration happening the main knowledge of the American history, at least is what I'm meaning. Yeah. What I remember from my education about the revolutionary war was, was the great awakening, the Boston massacre, the Boston tea party, like then Concord. Then, then it jumps to some of my classes mentioned Saratoga, but most didn't. That kind of just jumps to Yorktown and the end of the war and then the constitution. And that's where it ends. That, that that's, and it just jumps. It just jumps entire areas, which I understand. Like if you're in a class that you have a limited amount of time to discuss a lot of these topics, there's going to be some stuff that you leave out, but the stuff that they choose to leave out is some profoundly important things. And the stuff they leave in is either not at all important or it's just active misinformation. I'm honestly surprised at how much, I don't know if it's willful misinformation, but misinformation there is in American history class because at least the way it was presented to me, the American Revolution didn't have a whole lot much more to it. It felt like we were taught the whole ins and outs and we didn't miss a thing. Yeah, and I know that 
I have I have never given the American Revolution the as as a perspective a hopeful historian hopeful eventually like professional academic historian which is where i'd like to be someday i hope that i never give any period of history the cold shoulder that i have given to the american revolution because in my research of this topic i have i i mentioned this before but like the i've i've come to a whole new opinion about the revolutionary war and it wasn't the simple the simple uh dumbed down sort of ev- chain of events that i always associated it with and it, it it has so many layers of aspects of colonial american society and british british culture and relationships between different communities of people there's so much stuff to unpack and to analyze and to understand in order to fully grasp what was happening that I didn't give respect to and I have a newfound respect for. And I there's I'm never going to make that mistake again with any period of history. I'm never going to say that a period of any period of history is boring because if I find myself saying that, I'm just saying I don't know anything about the period. And that's at at that point I need to start reading and start learning about it. Honestly, I think you're right. I'm pretty sure there are plenty of parts of history where we're like, I think I know everything. No, we don't. Like, there's so much that's probably left out where there's enough context where we can learn more that it's not just, oh, we learned the specialized knowledge that doesn't really matter. No, there's more context to probably every historical period or event that we know of and it kind of ticks me off that our history education is so incomplete but at the same time I can understand why it's so incomplete because it's hard to get into these nuances it's honestly at the end of the day, not necessary, but gives so much more information to us that makes things more relatable or at least gives context in a way where we're not judging. Like the biggest thing I can think of is the Benedict Arnold. Benedict Arnold is kind of a sympathetic figure in my eyes. I mean, he's not a good person, but he's not the evil person that our history classes kind of pain him to be. Yeah. And that's, that's a big lesson that I hope I can through, through talking about figures like Ethan Allen and Benedict Arnold. I hope that I can help people understand that history isn't as complicated as good and bad people doing good and bad things. It, it's a matter of honestly this this whole podcast has kind of made me sit back and think at well yes someone's actions if you summarized it all together in a modern context are quote unquote evil like if you wanted to look at alexander the great if you just purely looked on his actions not his historical context he looks like an evil motherfucker and if you want to look at the his actions on Frederick the Great, just based on what we've learned so far, honestly, he doesn't look like that bad of a person, but he didn't do everything right or he wasn't all good, if you if you understand what I'm getting at there. Yeah. Yeah, he he Yeah, like Frederick, he was a he was a man with convictions and ideas about the way that he had to live and he had to lead and he put that into practice and it wasn't a matter of good and bad and in the broad scope of things it was a matter of what he thought was good and bad and the effect that the way that he led his kingdom eventually shaped what would come after and 
I, you're right. You're honestly a hundred percent right. Um, it, it really shines a light on historically people we perceive to be bad. If you want to call it that aren't necessarily that. And those that we perceive to be good, aren't that it's just like every person isn't perfect. It's the, the world isn't black and white. It's, various shades of gray kind of argument being proven time and time again. Yeah. And it, and like, I think Ethan is a really good example of like, people are affected by the world around them and they're influenced in ways that make them make certain decisions that lead to certain consequences that then shape the world and lead to leading to influencing other people to make different decisions and that that it uh, ethan is i think the perfect perfect example of that is he he is he is the absolute perfect example he did a lot to progress uh the pre-revolution and revolutionary sentiments and even though in the middle of the revolutionary war he was kind of like just taken off the playing board he still had an important place to play throughout history, even if we don't teach about him or learn about him. Yeah. Even, yeah, even while he was rotting in, in ship bilges and, or prison cells, people were still arguing over him and his condition across the English speaking world. And that that influence that just him existing in a particular state had on the discourse and the eventual uh, like ideas that developed out of that is has had a genuine like effect on the way that we we live and the way that our social systems function today. And he he didn't even have an active part to probably play in that. He was just they he, he was he was just having stuff happen to him and the world around him he was just reacting to what he was given to be honest at the time and he did what his moral character said he should do at the time yeah and that's i mean fuck that's all of us man we we just end up you're right and we could go on and on and on about how Ethan Allen was a product of his time, or honestly, we are a product of our time. But at the end of the day, each person is following their moral compass as much as they want to or are forced to, given the context. And we really just have to respect people who at least stay true to their moral compass as much as they could, given their... Um, responsibilities and the challenges they were faced with. Yeah. Like, like good, good and bad put aside. Like I can respect, I can respect somebody like Frederick or Ethan better than I can somebody like Alexander, even though I can empathize with them. I, I honestly, I understand why Alexander the great is the way he was. Do I think he's a good person? No. Do I respect him as a person? No. Do I respect his accomplishments? Begrudgingly, yes. But begrudgingly, yeah. Yes, begrudgingly, because he was by all contexts, at least from a modern sense, because like everything is from a modern sense. You can't really look back on it and use historical context because you don't have the historical social context is he was a shitty person he was a horrible human being and he probably wouldn't roll in today's times i don't know we've got guys like zuckerberg he's basically like a like a nerdy shitty alexander the great i don't know if alexander the great i feel like alexander the great was only good because he could do war i don't know if he had well, yes, he had strategic plans. I don't know if he had anything outside, like of, like a, 
either like a warrior's tic-tac-toe or chess. I I don't know if he could have applied that in a different way. Obviously, if he was in modern context, he would have better knowledge. But I don't know. There's there's no way to answer that question. I think of it in the context of like like a guy with wealth and power who thinks that because he's really good at one particular thing that he's good at everything. I mean, you're not wrong. Look at Zuckerberg, Musk, Bill Gates, um, the entire NFT community, Biden, Trump, everyone, like every political figure likes to extend their fingers, whether it's literal political or like even a celebrity they're technically political at a certain point. If you want to get into the weeds about it, they like to enunciate their opinion on everything and refuse to say, I don't know enough or I, I can't give an opinion on this. They refuse to, they have to put their foot in their mouth at every point in time. Well, whether you like the person or not, like they feel like they do don't have to be questioned if you get what I'm saying. Yeah, I gotcha. Tim, do you have anything to plug? Uh, just my Twitter. You can find me at Tim, aka Otis, on Twitter. What about you, Derek? Find me on Twitter. Uh, yeah. Oh, wow, I'm drunk. Holy fuck. They can find you at Twitter at what? At Visigoth. The, the first I is a one, the O is a zero. And if you would like to follow the podcast dedicated social media as you can find us on facebook and instagram at the alexander society pod and alex society pod on twitter if you enjoyed this show please rate and review us on your favorite streaming podcast of choice